This is the story of the Lone Ranger played by Pedro Pascal, unexpectedly taking charge of a weird, alien-looking creature with magical blood and tasked with transporting it safely across a hostile world. Why is there The Last of Us footage playing as I speak? God damn it, this is the wrong script. Hold on. Let me just put up the Mandalorian one. Yep, yeah, okay, here we go. This is the story of the Lone Ranger played by Pedro Pascal, unexpectedly taking charge of a weird alien-looking creature with magical blood and tasked with transporting it safely across a hostile galaxy. I always wanted to like the Mandalorian. Oh no, my friend. This is a mistake, a terrible mistake. They've gone too far. This is mad. From its inception, it's been occasionally optimistic, fundamentally unserious, almost always a bit careless, and usually quite good fun. Coming off the back of the profound disaster of the sequel trilogy, here was a show that had few pretensions, no delusions of grandeur, no desire to stamp its mark and the mark of its creators on the galaxy it was set in. We live in an age where not being an evil shit counts as a pleasant relief, and so it's impossible to separate The Mandalorian's early success from the epic disaster of what came so soon before it. That early success disproves the lie that Star Wars fans are impossible to please. Mando is full of glaring flaws, including in its lore and its world building, which are superficially at least supposed to be its strengths. It's a show designed for people who aren't paying it complete attention, something to have on while you're doing something else. The show's initial success in depicting the Star Wars galaxy in something like a recognizable form with all its charming variety, is itself a kind of distraction. A fan base desperate to inhabit that galaxy again has been invited back into it, and our minds have been left to wander off as Mando's, um, I suppose we have to call it Mando's plot, holds at most half of our attention. The more attention you do pay to season one, and especially to season two, the less enjoyable the show becomes. Why, after seeing a flashback to Mando's childhood during the Clone Wars, do we then cut to a scene of the armorer telling him with mystical vagueness about this mythical set of people known as Jedi, as though they weren't intimately involved in the war we just saw? Why does Mando always make the worst possible decisions, using the best weapons in the worst moments and the worst weapons in the best moments? Why does he always forget that he has a spaceship in those situations where it would be incredibly useful for him to have remembered that he has a spaceship? Why go to the trouble of explaining the history of a town like Mos Pelago, only then for the expositor to tell us that they knew about the crate dragon that's currently destroying said town before they built the town on top of it? How and why the tracking fobs work unfailingly throughout season one, only then to disappear and never be mentioned again, despite how fantastically useful and easily distributed they used to be, and so on, and so on. There are several examples from every single episode of this show, and the number of these errors tends to increase with the later episodes. But many liked the show despite these flaws, and many more were and are determined to like it whatever its flaws, because it represents a superficial turn toward the halcyon days of Star Wars. A stumbling turn, to be sure, looking over your shoulder through clouded eyes, probably a bit drunk, memory most definitely hazy, but yeah, it's nostalgic enough. An innocent show for a more civilized age. Its flaws are irksome, though, because so many of them, in season one at least, were fundamentally sloppy, careless, and needless. True narrative flaws occur where writers write themselves into positions where they cannot but utilize a ridiculous contrivance to solve it. There are true narrative flaws in Mando, but I don't think they constitute the majority of its errors. The majority could be solved by characters simply not uttering stupid lines, or by a slight tweak to the setup to better marry cause with consequence, or by having Mando take different and more sensible actions to achieve the same result. That being the case, the flaws are both more frustrating and, to a sympathetic audience, more forgettable. They're frustrating because they are so easy to fix, and they're forgettable because, ah, fuck it, we're not really paying attention to this show, are we? At least it looks a little bit like Star Wars. Each episode of the show has tended to have a clear enough idea of where it's wanted to go, but they've seldom been especially fussed about how they've got there. Hence nonsensical contrivances to manufacture fight scenes and set pieces. IG-11, appearing from nowhere to pick up the baby he's supposed to nurse and protect, and then driving them both straight into the midst of a few hundred stormtroopers. That's a pretty good example. Hence also filler dialogue that, through mere carelessness, just happens to contradict itself and everything around it, and so on, and so on. The writing process for each episode of this show seems to be, this is where we are, this is where we want to end, how do we make this happen? Hmm, I don't know, how about we have Mando try and use a face scanner while wearing his fucking helmet? Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool, that'll do. 
The show as a whole, however, has never been quite so clear on its premise or on its destination. Hence, many of its constituent inspirations, buddy cop, lone ranger, family adventure, competing with each other. Some of season 1's strongest moments were Mando's self-sacrificial attempts to save Grogu, since this affords him the semblance of much-needed character and motive. Some of season 1's strongest moments were also his solo missions, with the prison ship adventure coming most readily to mind. But the show struggled to marry these two approaches. The prison ship was only possible because they literally locked Baby Yoda in a cupboard for the duration. Mando's self-sacrificial moments only came about because he inexplicably brought Baby Yoda along for whatever that particular ride might have been, making the need for his self-sacrifice seem all too often very convenient. The show couldn't be both a series of standalone adventures following a simple guy trying to make his way in the universe and a continuous story made of interconnecting arcs and journeys but it tried to be both, and this created problems. You get the sense it was sold on the basis of its premise, but its unexpected success shackled it to a purpose it was never meant to fulfill, which is why its narrative issues stack up the longer the show goes on. It was simply never meant to tell this kind of story in this kind of way. These all being criticisms, it's worth highlighting a couple of things deserving of qualified praise, because, hey, I just hate everything, you see? I never praise anything by comparison, or praise the specific bits of otherwise bad shows that actually work. Mando has always had a pretty strong cast of recurring characters. Colourful, mostly well-performed, oftentimes quite charming, with personalities and backstories that either distracted from, or highlighted, the lack of the same in its protagonist, depending on your tastes and viewing habits. Grief Karga, Kara Dune, and Season 1's Ugnaught Quill stand out, while Botox Karen has the advantage of carrying in a lot of character work done in other shows. Not a point of praise for The Mandalorian, admittedly, but contributing to the vague sense that the character does actually belong in this universe and has something like a history here. Its recurring ancillary characters, though not especially deep, they seldom need to be, also add colour and personality and selectively charm to the universe. They often seem like people you would expect to see in a Star Wars production. If that sounds like the faintest of all possible praise, oh my, this character kind of has a personality, well, consider everything else Star Wars has done in the Disney era. Hell, we got through three feature films without ever establishing a personality for most of the protagonists. Other characters had significant potential, though that was wasted to varying degrees. Werner Herzog's villainous turn as the client in particular, who gave us something almost interesting in his ideological defense of the Empire. The Empire improves every system it touches, judged by any metric. Safety, prosperity, trade, opportunity, peace. Only for the much more boilerplate sinister disappointment of Moff Gideon to cut him down for no very good reason in the preamble to season 1's most nonsensical battle sequence. But in both cases, you get the sense that the vague idea of a character is there. There was the sketch or the outline of an intriguing villain. The flaw then is not in the intent, but in the delivery. This can't really be said of the main cast, however, where several fragments of competing ideas struggle for dominance and none really establishes itself. Stronger side characters and weaker protagonists is a weird and not uncommon trait in modern media. Mando works up to a point because he is a blank protagonist. It more or less demands that the audience read motive and purpose onto him because, for all his blathering about the code, his relationships really have very little grounding. You and I can sit here and say, well, he immediately falls for Baby Yoda because of his foundling backstory, I guess, because he sees the resemblance to his own past. This is what turns a ruthless, cold-hearted mercenary into a loving surrogate father. But we'd be doing quite a lot of work on the writer's part here. It would require a conscious deployment of good faith in interpretation, because if you look at it as a critic, at what the show actually establishes, you have to acknowledge that Mando's pre-show character is at best loosely implied, and his character switch in Season 1, Episode 1 is from something ill-defined to something conveniently plastered on. From what? Why? And to what end? Throughout Season 1, the show didn't so much struggle to answer these questions as it blithely skirted them entirely. We don't really know who Mando is. We can't really trace the origin of his attachments. He doesn't really have a personality. While Grogu's character is cute, his personality is cute, the origin of all of these things is cute, and everything he does is done to be cute. Otherwise, we're told he's about 50 years old, but that species grow at different rates, meaning that he's still a baby. Except where the show requires him to be more intelligent than a baby, in which case he can understand complex instructions and handle complex tasks. Until the show requires that he's a baby again, in which case he reverts. Species grow at different rates indeed. Some of them grow and regress several times within a half an hour episode, apparently. 
Continuing on the theme of qualified praise, there is, of course, lots of fan service across seasons 1 and 2. Obvious nostalgia bait, but it was usually unobtrusive and, by and large, it fit the present-day world it was depicting. Early on, pit droids on Tatooine are there because that's their job, the Jawas act as Jawas act where Jawas are supposed to act. An ATST falling into the hands of a militia is the believable consequence of a collapsing and retreating empire, even if the way they went about taking that down was, typically, the longest and least sensible of all the strategies they had at their disposal. But in the show's earlier stages, this all contributed to the distraction watching I mentioned at the top. It did feel, for the most part, like a faithful enough depiction of the galaxy we've all wanted to go back to, contributing to our immersion and helping us avoid paying attention to the writing. This gradually declined into obtrusive nostalgia bait, however. Replacing the Razor Crest, the ideal bounty hunting ship, with an N1 starfighter is like force-feeding fans member berries with a blunderbuss. It was lovely to see it, sure, but it's so spectacularly unsuited to his life and his job. Of course, seeing Grogu stick his head out of the top is cute, great for merchandising, but it actively subordinates the fictional world to real-world sales pitches and thus harms the immersion that was once the show's strength. This kind of thing gets worse the longer the show goes on and, as we'll shortly see, becomes completely ridiculous as we enter Season 3. And yet, all that being said, the show has consistently brilliant visuals, superb production value, an innovative score, some brilliant and even iconic design work. Ultimately, it doesn't lack the ingredients for success. If anything, it has, or it's had, too many, and the chef has been too incompetent to make a proper meal of all of that. Mando began with an intriguing premise, it had money, it had heart, it had, presumably, the best intentions, but eventually a premise has to be turned into a story, and that is where everything goes wrong with this show. In part, this is because The Mandalorian spends so long on its side quests and filler episodes that its main arc, such as it is, doesn't have the time or occur with the frequency required to establish itself. The vast majority of any given season is little more than filler. Again, its premises and its inspirations compete with each other, they do not align. Mando the Bounty Hunter is supposed to conflict with Mando the Surrogate Father in-universe, but in fact, he conflicts with him out-universe. The attempt to balance these two concepts and approaches is responsible for a huge amount of the narrative and writing flaws displayed across the first two seasons. The close of season two presented a chance to finally rectify this. Luke's implausible appearance and his decision to take and train Grogu ought to have been the point of departure. Grogu's arc is done, at least for now. At last, we can focus on whatever Mando's purpose is. But then, the Book of Boba Fett happened. A lot of the criticism of Grogu's return to Mando in The Book of Boba Fett is simply that this event, which is pivotal to the events of one show, in fact took place in another. That's certainly unconventional, but I don't consider it bad in its own right, not necessarily. If the ambition is to create or to recreate a shared, expanded universe, having the stories set within it overlap can be a good thing. Since both Boba and Mando are Disney Plus shows, you don't have the access problems presented by, for example, Marvel's attempts to overlap its cinematic and its streaming productions. If you can watch The Mandalorian, you can watch The Book of Boba Fett and vice versa for no extra cash. The problem, though, is that these two things must then be written as one production, not as two separate ones, with a bonus arc to tie them together. And The Mandalorian has trouble presenting itself as one production. The worst of all worlds sees, in fact saw, a long, tedious, comically inept and largely irrelevant Boba Fett show that alienated its audience long before it presented us with the information vital to understanding the next season of The Mandalorian. Asking people to sit through hours of dances with Tuscans, to suffer the pointless plot of Boba just for the brief payoff of Mando and Grogu's reuniting is, put politely as possible, not a good plan. The rest of the season being equal parts irritating and unintentionally comical and bafflingly redundant more or less invited the fanbase to skip The Book of Boba Fett, only to return to the much more popular Mandalorian, or so we thought then, having missed a vital piece of what passes for its story. For anyone who justifiably passed over Boba, Mando's second chapter ends with his ship destroyed and Grogu gone, and his third chapter begins with a new ship and Grogu back, with the most consequential actions happening during the intermission. If you were then to go back and watch The Book of Boba Fett with a mind to catching up on what you missed, you would likely bail anyway after the first couple of episodes because an intermission is preferable. At least you get to take a shit rather than watching shit on the screen. Like The Mandalorian's episodes of The Book of Boba Fett both look and feel so very different from the rest of the production and taken in isolation form a much more natural beginning to Mando Season 3 than the one we actually get, 
only lends more weight to the suggestion that that was the original intent and that those episodes were lifted from their planned running order and pasted in to bolster a flagging Boba Fett show. One of the problems dogging The Mandalorian since its inception has been that its consequential episodes are few and far between, the bulk of any given season being filler, and so the trade-off for boosting an irredeemable Boba Fett show is that Mando's third season was stripped of its consequential beginning. Instead, it debuts with more filler, something that's become less forgivable and more irksome the longer the show has limped on. What made season one a curiosity and season two a bit of a slog has, by season three, come to seem at best careless and at worst as though the writers have taken the show's popularity for granted. And that's just one small part of the wealth of evidence the prosecution can muster, as we will shortly see. Because it's not just that Favreau and co are taking liberties with our time, it's that their scripts have become so staggeringly careless, even by the standards of a very careless show, that you'd be forgiven for feeling a bit insulted. Who do these hacks think they are? What do they take me for? It's not to credit the writers that they've tried to smooth the gap between Mando and the Book of Boba Fett by reducing the former to the latter's low level. None of which is to say that the show is hateable. It isn't. Far from it. It's still kind of enjoyable, just not for the right reasons. In season one, you could occasionally laugh with as well as at the show. You can still laugh at the show, and in the modern media landscape, that probably does count for something. One of the biggest reasons for Mando's relative popularity at the start is that even at its worst, it's always been a bit fun. It's never been too serious. It's never felt evil or consciously destructive. It doesn't give the impression that it hates its fans or the universe it's set in or the franchise it's a part of. Any more than a sincere but catastrophically written bit of fan fiction gives the sense that its author actually hates the thing that they're unintentionally parodying. Mando remains kind of fun, still makes you suspect that its heart is in the right place, it's just that its brain has been distracted to the point of dementia. As and when the series shuffles off this mortal coil, I don't think we'll look back on it as we did The Last Jedi and conclude that it hated its own existence and that of its fans. But the longer it goes on, the more these fans will get the sense that they've been taken for granted, and that their goodwill was squandered by lazy writers who were capable of much better, but couldn't be asked to show it. And Star Wars fans are so impossibly hard to please that so many for so long were satisfied with the simple combination of superficiality and vague good intentions. Now then, since this little overview of the show's recent past has inevitably brought us up to the present, I suppose it is probably about time we review what Season 3 has given us so far. So, strap yourselves in. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a ride. The Disney Plus subheading for Season 3 Episode 1 is The Mandalorian Begins an Important Journey, prompting anyone still watching to exclaim, What, another one? You might think, given what we've already said about the natural beginning of this season occurring halfway through the Book of Boba Fett, and given that this episode absolutely requires the viewer to be familiar with those events in order to understand the premise, that the obligatory flashbacks in the introduction would cover… well, those events. But that would make an awful lot of sense, and this is an episode of The Mandalorian, so naturally it's not quite what we get. Instead, we get flashbacks to IG-11's death at the close of Season 1, to Grief Karga's rebuilt city on Navarro, to Mando's first meeting with Botox Karen, and then, finally, to the other bit of very important information from Boba Fett. Mention of Mando's excommunication and the task he has to undertake, bathing in the living waters beneath the ruins of Mandalore, to earn his repentance. So already we're left with a slightly confusing mess, various snippets of information, we can assume that the flashback to the blacksmith sending him off on his quest is the important journey this episode is supposedly beginning. Though of course this episode isn't beginning that at all, because that began in the flashback to the Book of Boba Fett. Of the rest, we've been reminded that Botox Karen exists and that Navarro is a place, and that IG-11 blew himself up way back in Season 1. Some of these clips seem more obviously relevant than others. Yes, it's good to be reminded of the other characters who one presumes will go on to play some kind of role in Season 3, but what of the droid? What possible relevance could that have, you might wonder? The answer is… absolutely none. So naturally, we will spend most of this episode pursuing that. These flashbacks not having established all that much, the writers evidently felt the need to manufacture some pretext for filling in the Book of Boba Fett sized hole in its own narrative. So we open with the armorer in a cave on a new sandy planet, smelting some of that incredibly rare Beskar that she's always smelting in every scene in which she features, leaving us to wonder just how the hell she keeps getting a hold of it. She's making a helmet for a young Mandalorian recruit 
played by Jimmy Kimmel's nephew, nepotism being the only force more powerful than the force in this galaxy far, far away. I praised the production values in the introduction, and I'm sure I will praise them again throughout this video, but it's worth pointing out here that the Mandalorian helmets look pretty naff in this scene and in their subsequent scenes. The old, beaten up and battered ones work pretty well, and Mando's shiny chrome dome looks cool enough and imposing and all the rest, but a good proportion of those we see in our reintroduction to the covert here look far too new, their matte coloured paintwork befitting something from Power Rangers, not this show. There are plenty of ways to go about fixing this, the new helmets could have a rougher hue, more flaws and imperfections from substandard ore for example, their paint jobs could be… Uh, less shit. As it is, they look like something you'd pick up off the shelf at a toy store. And given this is Star Wars, you probably can. What we're seeing here is an initiation ceremony. Jimmy Kimmel's nephew is old enough to join their ranks, so he's been given his helmet. This makes the Mandalorians basically the opposite of the Jews, I guess. <laughs> and made to recite the creed, swearing on the ancestors and all that. And then, suddenly, a crocodile. Which is not the last time this show will do suddenly monster to move itself along. There are a few things to note about this. In the first place, it begs the question, just how long have they been here? It's implied here and later that they've been ensconced in this little cave for quite some time, in which case, did they not know that their ceremonial lake was inhabited by giant prehistoric munching monsters? The blacksmith detecting its approach would imply they did know this, though you'd think they might then have chosen to relocate somewhere away from Lake Placid for the sake of the children. Oh, and this is only the second most ridiculous monster-related plot point across these first four episodes? It gets considerably worse later. In the second place, you'll note that Jimmy Kimmel's nephew, who I guess we'll call the Nepolorian, is a child and not an especially tall one, and he's been standing in water that comes up to his knees. You will also note that Crocodilosaurus here is, what, 20 feet tall? So how then could it remain fully submerged until mere inches away from where the small child is standing? Is there some sort of underwater cliff just behind the boy? I mean, that would make some superficial sense. Though Croc Boy here would then have crashed into that cliff, so no, no, that still wouldn't have worked. Then, in the third place, and as is a consistent theme for this show, why the hell do these trained soldiers and mercenaries, many of whom have jetpacks and all of whom used ranged weapons, decide the best way to tackle this amphibious toothy twat is to run toward it and fire at it from feet away from its huge death mouth? Why? Why, for fuck's sake, does one of them try to use a flamethrower at this watery wanker? Why do they decide to fly up and place bombs on its clearly armoured back rather than its clearly less armoured sides and belly? Why the fuck did they fire rope darts at a 50 ton giant monster? What exactly did they think they would achieve by doing this? The thing must weigh like 60 times more than all of them put together, they're not going to pull it. Ugh, it's probably the worst tactic you could possibly have deployed. So obviously it's the one they go for. And it's not as though the writers here have the excuse that they're new to all of this. The exact same trick was tried in the battle against the Great Dragon in Season 2, though there with the added nonsense of the Tuscans not letting go of the ropes when it started yanking them around. No, you're still holding on! Let go! It was incredibly dumb then, it is incredibly dumb now. What you want to do when attacked by a giant slow ground-bound dinosaur is get away from it and shoot it from a distance, something that's very easy to accomplish if you're wearing a jetpack. But no. They persist in standing right next to it and shooting at it ineffectually as it waddles around until, finally, Mando shows up in his N1 and torpedoes it, killing it instantly and sending guts flying everywhere. Toys need to be sold, so then Baby Yoda sticks his head up from the dome. By the way, you might be wondering, hmm, I wonder what they will do with this huge carcass that's lying in front of their cave that's far too big for them to move? Well, the answer is nothing. It's just going to disappear later and nothing more needs to be said about that. This predictably insane action sequence dispensed with, the show now has a chance to redo the scene setting that the Book of Boba Fett stole from it. The blacksmith tells Mando that he removed his helmet, so he is no longer a Mandalorian. Mando says the Creed teaches about redemption. She replies that it's no longer possible because Mandalore has been destroyed. He puts a trinket on the table, with a Mandalorian inscription on it, explaining that he was given it by some Jawas who got it from a traveler who said he had visited Mandalore which suggests that the planet might not be all glass and poison gas after all. So if he goes there and bathes in the waters, he can be redeemed after all. The armorer says, yep, and so off he goes. Now the problem with this scene 
is that it's necessary out universe because no sane person stuck with the Book of Boba Fett all the way through. It's not necessary in universe because they've already had this conversation. Mando learns nothing new here. He isn't given new information or a new task or new tools or new context. He's not gained anything by returning to the covert to replay the conversation he had had in the other show. The armorer gains new information, Mando showing her the trinket that, fittingly for this show, seems to have just been spawned in his backpack off screen because fuck the setup, I guess. But she doesn't need this new information either. Condensed, the conversation has Mando show up and say, that thing you told me before, that's the thing I need to do, isn't it? She says, yes. He says, and I can do it, can't I? She says, I guess you can. And then he leaves. We are now more than a quarter of the way through the opening episode of this season, and absolutely nothing has been achieved. We could have sat watching Mando have a fag for 10 minutes, then get to his feet and say, I guess I'd better be off then. That is the same depth of content. At a push, the mention of Mandalore's poisoned atmosphere might count as new information, but, well, no, it doesn't actually justify the rest of the episode, but it is what the show considers to be set up for the rest of the episode. The problem is, Mando already knows the rumors about the poison in the atmosphere. He didn't need to return to the blacksmith to have this confirmed to him or to receive it as new information. So, so no, actually, there is no way in universe that this isn't just a pointless rehash of a conversation he has already had. Off to a great start, I'm sure you'll agree. Now, I mentioned that the show thinks the little snippet of info about the poisoned atmosphere excuses the rest of this episode. Why does the show think that? Well, because Mando concludes that to test whether the atmosphere is indeed poisoned, he will need a droid. We'll learn in a later episode that he doesn't need a droid after all, but the writers haven't written that bit yet, so for now, this is what they're going to go with. If unwisely you paid attention during previous seasons, you would know that Mando began with a severe dislike for droids, thanks to his childhood experiences in the Clone Wars. It's a premise the show could have done rather a lot with, but unfortunately that became inconvenient to the plot, so the writers decided to do away with it and have Mando be fine with droids after all. Sorry gang, come on, you know he doesn't like droids. <laughs> May as well let them have at it. The crest needs a good once over. Oh, so he likes droids now. This is called a character arc. However, discarding this part of his backstory because it had become inconvenient has itself now become inconvenient. So Mando can't just use any droid for the job we'll later discover he doesn't need a droid for in the first place. Oh no, he needs a droid that he can trust. And this is why the recap at the beginning showed us IG-11. Because though that droid absolutely obliterated itself to buy time for their escape, and hasn't been seen since for the understandable reason that it no longer exists, it's also the only droid in the entire galaxy that Mando trusts, so we're off to Navarro to retrieve it, even though it doesn't exist anymore. Some significant time has passed since we were last with all of these characters. I believe Favreau suggested Baby Yoda has spent years training with Luke in the Book of Boba Fett, which, I mean, I guess, okay then? Anyway, in that time, Navarro has turned into a lovely, thriving little spaceport. Its main export would appear to be Easter eggs, since the walk through the streets is absolutely full of them. Cook droids, those salacious crumb things, quirky alien musicians, TV droids from the Coruscant Senate chamber, etc. We come upon a statue dedicated to IG-11, which is already suspiciously convenient. No one else on this planet witnessed his sacrifice. It can't have any reputation at all, and even if the statue was erected on the sole orders of Grief Karga, who never evinced much care for the droid in the five minutes of screen time they shared, the rest of the population must be a little bit nonplussed to see a statue to this unknown droid given pride of place in their high street. Hell, it'd be even more suspiciously convenient if it turned out the statue was actually made of the top half of IG-11. Not least because the entire thing was so clearly destroyed in Season 1, and the whole point of the self-destruct function, as it repeatedly told us, was to prevent precisely this thing from happening. Manufacturer's protocol dictates I cannot be captured. I must self-destruct. Do not self-destruct. But that would all be completely absurd, wouldn't it? So no, I'm sure it won't happen. It's the Mandalorian, it definitely will happen. We're reintroduced to Grief, which which now I say that, yeah, that's a meta comment, isn't it? We're reintroduced to Grief Karga. He's a magistrate now, a high magistrate on Navarro, and he's invited Mando in to catch up on old times. There's a construction boom, he tells us. There's money to be made. Mando helped the town once, so in return, Grief offers him land and a big house, that sort of thing. Mando says, nah, because, you know, here's another recap for the Book of Boba Fett, for your benefit, audience. It's complicated. 
I completed my quest. He returned to me. I removed my helmet, and now I'm an apostate. And then they're interrupted by a protocol droid who informs them that suddenly, pirates. The pirates spend some minutes attempting to gain access to a school because they think it's a pub, which might have elicited a brief smirk, except that they then continue to demand that they be allowed to drink in the school, and they continue, and they continue, and it goes from being a joke into becoming an extended standoff scene, even though they know it's a school, and even though Grief's invited them to drink back in his office, but, but no, we needed the standoff, so here's the manufactured pretext. On we go, and on we go. The pirates are upset that Grief won't do business with them anymore. He tells them to go back and tell their captain that Navarro, which notably lacks any security guards whatever, is no longer friendly to the pirates, thereby, you might think, putting a big fat crosshairs on his entire community. A shootout ensues, and Mando kills most of the pirates. They now have an additional grudge against this magistrate and his entirely defenseless town. Not only has he slagged them off and rejected them, he's also seen a bunch of them killed. All save one of them, in fact. Now, I spotted this problem on my first watch, as I was watching, and I have no notable history as a criminal navigating the intergalactic black market. You've just told these heavily armed and angry pirates that your defenseless town hates them and won't do business with them. So, you'd surely have spotted the danger you've just put yourself in. Obviously, you're a sitting duck, a fat sitting duck. The one thing you wouldn't want is for word to get back to the pirate captain, because if it did, he would come back and rape, kill, and eat that duck, and not necessarily in that order. So what does hardened, world-wise, formerly ruthless criminal and bounty guild head Grief Karga say to the one surviving pirate? He kills him, right? To stop word of his vulnerability reaching the captain? No. No, he doesn't, because that would make sense. Instead, he explicitly instructs the surviving pirate to go back and tell his captain what's just happened, and that the town is respectable now, so fuck you up the barnacles. Yes, he lets him go, with all of that information, basically inviting the pirates back to raid the town. Mando, to his slight credit, does think this is an odd decision as well. He asks, are you sure you want to let him go? And Grief replies, He'll let it be known that Navarro is respectable now, and not to be trifled with. You fucking moron, that's insane! He knows the town's undefended, because only after he's let the pirate go does he turn to Mando and say he needs a marshal. This is the show's opportunity, by the way, to gently move beyond the unpleasant Gina Carano stuff. Marshal Cara Dune has been vicariously Rose Teacoed. She can't come because she's off doing super secret things with the special forces. I make no comment on that old controversy because, frankly, I lack the time or the will, and there's too much to criticize in the show itself. Like, for example, Grief letting the pirate go while knowing his town is undefended. Like, for example, the fact he only offers Mando the job of protecting the town after he lets the pirate go. Like, for example, that in the previous scene, he offered Mando a plot of land with the express promise that he would be able to, and I quote, You can settle down, you can hang up your blaster, live off the fat of the land. It's a peculiar show that wastes an entire episode nominally trying to revive an ancillary character from two seasons ago, while being unable to remember what its own characters were saying two seconds ago. But I guess that's why Jon Favreau gets paid the big bucks. Mando says, nah, again, because he's too busy, effectively repeating the conversation the show forgot took place two seconds ago. Only for Grief to say, apologies, I didn't know you were here on business, even though that was pretty clearly the conclusion of that conversation the show forgot took place two seconds ago. I appreciate the offer, but I have some matters to look after. Lest we forget why we're here, we are very conveniently standing beneath the IG-11 statue, again, and Mando explains that he needs him back, Grief correctly points out that IG-11 was destroyed, but Mando points to the statue and says, These are his parts, are they not? So, um, just for, for your benefit, guys, and, you know, if I could for his as well, let me just play IG-11's death scene again. You know, the one we saw a flashback to in the introductory recap. Adventures protocol dictates I cannot be captured. I must be destroyed. <laughs> There were, quite clearly, no parts left to salvage. That was the point of the self-destruct mechanism to begin with. But even accepting that the show has retroactively dialed down the force of the explosion, how did Mando know this? When he last saw IG-11, it was walking through molten lava and then it exploded. How the fuck could he have known, in advance, 
that bits of IG-11 survived and were kept and were made into a statue. Usable bits, the most important bits. That's three massively implausible assumptions to make. What if none of that had been true? What if only half of it had been true? What if the only surviving part had been one of his fingers? Well, he'd have had to use another droid, wouldn't he? Which he'd have been fine with because the show dispensed with those trust issues ages ago. It's just that it forgot about that. But Grief says, fine. So they dismantle the statue and start trying to fix it, which Mando can kind of do, actually. It turns out it's as simple as hot wiring a car. So you're telling me that they cared enough about the droid to turn it into a statue, but not to even try and turn it back on? Okay, then. It doesn't quite go to plan, alas. IG-11 reverts to its pre-nursing days and tries to execute the bounty on Baby Yoda again, giving us a brief Terminator reference. Mando, who offed the droid pretty easily in Season 1, Episode 1 with a single blaster bolt to the head, is conveniently incapable of shooting it in the head this time, because otherwise we couldn't have got the Terminator reference in. But then a protocol droid knocks the statue over and crushes its head, giving Mando the chance to deploy a James Bond tier quip. Now that's using your head. So it's busted again. However, and to use Grief's words, fortunately, the planet has attracted a bunch of Babu fricks. Taking one last look, sir, at my <laughs> who are famously the finest droidsmiths in the galaxy. So they take IG-11 to them. The fricks say they can't fix it because the memory circuit's broken. So Mando tells them to put in a new one. Which forces us to ask, as if we hadn't several times already, why? You wanted this droid specifically because you trusted it, even though you got over the trust issues ages ago. You revived it once, and it defaulted to murder bot settings. You've just been told its memory circuit is completely broken. Now, I'm no Babu Frick, but if you have to replace most of its body and all of its mind, it's not really the same droid, is it, Mando? This isn't some droid of Theseus paradox. The whole reason you're insisting on getting the old IG-11 back is that you want the old IG-11 back. You've already pranged it once because it had the wrong memories and so wasn't the same droid, and you're now proposing to replace its entire memory core, which might turn it into some anodyne factory settings assassin droid. But then, if you wanted an anodyne factory settings assassin droid, you could have just bought one, you metallic moose. Do you get the sense that maybe, just, just perhaps, the episode is, I don't know, filler? The Babu fucks reach the same conclusion, and so Mando offers to find a new memory circuit. They say that, yep, they could fix it with a new memory circuit, though they're very hard to find because they don't make them anymore. Just, just buy a new droid, for God's sake. But no, we are off now, on a side quest, so we can get the part we need to complete the side quest we started at the beginning of the episode which was necessary to complete the side quest that we need to complete to get back to the main quest that we learned about in the Book of Boba Fett. Great writing. Flying away from the planet, Mando and Grogu get ambushed by the pirates. In case we missed that they were pirates, all those many times they were specifically referred to as pirates, one of them goes all piratey, briefly, and announces himself by saying, Avast, Mandalorian. Avast. Which is a peculiar decision, as they don't otherwise speak like pirates at all, and you kind of think the writers just should have decided on one or the other. Either you pirate these guys up to 11 or you don't. You don't just throw in the odd very piratey word and otherwise present them as generic goons. A space battle follows that looks very pretty as you would expect, though it's also something of a conundrum. There's a whole, rich, undefended town down on the surface. The pirates have detected that its only defender, who only showed up by chance anyway, is now leaving that planet. If you're the pirates, do you A, swoop down on this now defenseless town and loot and plunder and pillage to your heart's content, or do you B, wait to ambush the sole defender as he's leaving the planet? If you picked A, congratulations. Not only would you make a better pirate than these chuckle fucks, you're also smarter than these disgustingly well-paid writers. If you picked B, you are a moron, and these disgustingly well-paid writers might even hire you. Mando takes out most of the pirate fighters in a generally impressive visual display, albeit one that was crying out for a soundtrack redolent of the asteroid chase in Empire, but that never even threatened to emerge. But the last remaining fighter baits Mando into the path of the Flying Dutchman, where the Mandalorian's own player on Davy Jones is waiting on a ship that looks suspiciously like a reskinned version of the Super Star Destroyer Eclipse from the old expanded universe. Mando has previously informed us that Davy Jones specializes in hijacking and such, so you'd think that perhaps his capital ship might have come equipped with 
tractor beams, and other snaring and snagging devices that would make hijacking possible to begin with. But because the plot needs the ship to have no tractor beam, it has no tractor beam, and Mando activates his big engine and zooms away before the Flying Dutchman can fire on him. It's not clear as yet whether Davy Jones will recur as a villain in this season, though he doesn't reappear in any of the four episodes we'll be reviewing today. We await with breath that is whatever the opposite of baited is. Now, we were off on a side quest to a side quest to a side quest to find the new memory circuit for IG-11. But rather than go straight there, wherever there is, the show seems to think that we now need to be reminded that Botox Karen exists, because we saw her in the recap at the beginning, but she's not had a scene yet. So instead of going off to the side quest, to the side quest, to the side quest, we make a brief detour to another side quest as Mando flies off to Botox Karen's castle on a planet in the Mandalorian system to have a brief chat. She's sitting all alone in the big old castle because, as she huffily informs us, all her followers abandoned her after Mando took the Darksaber. You know, all the followers that she had before she had the Darksaber. Yeah, they abandoned her because she continued to not have the Darksaber. Reasons. Why do we find all this out? Well, because Mando has come here to... Um, join her. To, to join her faction. Why? Fuck knows, but he has. This is her opportunity then to bitch about her followers leaving her and such. They stole the stolen fleet and went off to be mercenaries all across the galaxy, meaning, you'd think, we'll get a long reuniting the clan subplot at some point in this season, though again, we don't get much more than a hint of that across the first four episodes. The scene is an excuse for some Mando law exposition, albeit quite clunkily deployed. Mando himself has come here to join her in her quest to retake Mandalore, even though his side quest was to find a droid to test the atmosphere of Mandalore, where he was going anyway, to make sure it's not poisonous, even though he doesn't need to. It's unclear why it should have suddenly occurred to him in this moment to try and join her before doing all of that, knowing that he has the Darksaber anyway, that she's previously explained was her only hope of completing the mission he's come here to join her on, and given he seemingly had no plans to do this until, well, right now actually. It's become so important to him that he ditched the side quest, side quest, side quest to come here. But then, would it not have occurred to her to check if the planet she wants to retake has been poisoned? Except that now she's decided it's all pointless anyway because the planet's been completely poisoned and destroyed, which calls into question why she ever thought she could retake it, and why she's so pissed off that she can't. She dismisses Mando's care for the planet as mere superstition in the very scene where she's lamenting she can't uphold the superstition of uniting the Mandalorian clans by wielding the Darksaber. The show seems to recognize this slight contradiction. It actually has Mando tell her to make up her mind. There's nothing magic about the minds of Mandalore. They supplied Beskar ore to our ancestors and the rest is superstition. That planet has been ravaged, plundered, and poisoned. You said that the curse was a lie. Make up your mind. But she huffs and tells him where the mines are, so he leaves, promising to find out if the planet is really poisoned. In case what, we'd forgotten the premise for the episode? Yeah, yeah, the more you think about it, the more the word clunky just doesn't quite suffice. The whole scene is just very, very jarring. Internally, its characters flatly contradict their own past statements and beliefs. But even the scene's placement is weird. Wouldn't this have been a better first scene? Begin with him reaching out to Botox Karen? To be rebuffed? So then to resolve to carry on the mission alone, which sets him off on the stupid droid quest? Everything here seems distinctly disordered. Anyway, that's the end of episode 1, and believe it or not, it only gets significantly worse from here, so without any ado whatsoever, on we go to episode 2. This one is quite special in that it has the dubious distinction of having made me shout at the TV several times, and it takes quite a lot to make me do that, so let's begin. We're back on Tatooine. Yay! It's been so long! Our old friend Peli Motto, yes she has a name, is scamming a Rodian. It's Boon to Eve, which you'll remember from episode 1, possibly. Mando turns up with Baby Yoda in the cockpit, posing the question, how does he get from his little bubble dome into the cockpit? But then if we start asking basic mechanical questions like that, we'll never get through the video, so let's park that for now. There's much more serious nonsense to discuss. Mando's here to pick up that memory circuit for IG-69. Pol Potter tells him that neither she nor the Jawas she fucks, I'm not joking but I wish I was, well, they give me what I asked for in exchange, I let him pick through my dumpster. Can possibly find one, so why doesn't he buy this clunky old R5 droid instead? 
He says he can't take R5 because he needs one that can handle spelunking down in the mines while testing the air to see if it's poisonous. He also says he doesn't have room for it, even though he absolutely does because that's what Grogu's merch dome is for, you moron. She says he can have it for half price, which doesn't fix any of the serious issues preventing him from purchasing it. It can't spelunk, it's not good on adventures, he doesn't know it, so he doesn't trust it. Remember we just had that whole episode that clearly established, pointlessly but clearly, that he could only possibly countenance taking one very specific droid, and that that's why he's here to begin with? There's absolutely no way he can give up on IG-11 and take R5, so of course that's exactly what he does. F f fucking oh. Okay. This is the first time I shouted at the TV. This scene makes the entirety, the entirety of the preceding episode absolutely fucking redundant. Why? Why even bother? Why go through the whole rigmarole of trying to fix IG-11, taking up an eighth of the entire season's runtime, only to have him now turn up on Tatooine and say, yeah, fuck it, I'll just take a different droid instead. Why would you do that? What were you thinking, Favreau? Did you even read your own script? Uh, so you revive Mando's distrust of droids in order to excuse him going to one specific planet to recover a droid that obliterated itself way back in season one. You spend that entire episode piddling about with him trying to fix it. You clearly establish in Mando's mind that he can't take any other droid. You have him repeatedly told that the droid is broken. You have him go on not one, not two, but three side quests each nominally geared toward him fixing this one specific droid, you then send him to Tatooine on one of those side quests where he's offered another droid and he very clearly explains why the other droid isn't suitable, on top of all the reasons given in episode 1 for him not taking any other droid, you do all of that and then you have him say, yeah, I guess I can take R5 after all. This is the narrative equivalent of attempted suicide. The script is literally attempting self-deletion before our very eyes. It's really, it's, it's quite astonishing. This is why I'll insist that you don't even have to like The Mandalorian to acknowledge that season three is worse than one and two. I don't recall any instance of the scripts for those two seasons actively trying to fuck each other in the way season three episode two fucks season three episode one. It's like some weird nihilistic piece of performance art how utterly pointless can this episode make the previous one? How much time can we persuade the fans to waste before they get sick of it? Are you okay, Jon Favreau? Is this some desperate attempt to get yourself fired? I would believe it, but then, you know, you're working under Kathleen Kennedy, so you must know that the only way to get yourself fired from a Star Wars project is to have a good idea. Bad ideas are fine, she'll give you a whole feature film for those. Holy Allah's invisible testes, Batman, this show. Whew, okay, anyway, so with R5 in a fucking hell. With R5 installed in Grogu's old space pod, Mando is now off to the Mandalorian system again. Meaning that he's gone from Navarro to the Mandalorian system to Tatooine and back to the Mandalorian system across two episodes. You could have inserted his visit to Botox Karen here. It would have made more sense been much more efficient, could have panned out in the same futile way, you'd have just saved us time and Mando some fuel. And from go to Navarro, then go to Tatooine, then go to visit her, and then go to Mandalore. It's just, yeah, it's just efficiency. But, but no. Off he goes, down into the atmosphere of Mandalore, bringing to mind Luke's descent to Dagobah through the clouds and the rain and such. The show must want us to believe that he's the first Mandalorian ever to try this since The Purge, which doesn't make a great deal of sense since his whole reason for being here to begin with is Mandalore's religious significance, and Botox Karen's followers all left her because she failed to uphold their religious prophecy. So do you mean to tell me that the planet is so significant that no one until Mando bothered even to drop a droid off to the surface to see if the planet is really as fucked as they think it is? I wouldn't buy it, except that I have to buy it if I'm going to stick with the show, so I guess... Yeah, begrudgingly, I'm going to have to buy it. Mando takes the time to explain to us that the clouds in the atmosphere make off-world communications impossible. Report. And make it quick, as I am short on time. For you to say, Captain. There's a fortune to be had, plundering the hyperspace lane. From the surface, we won't be able to communicate with anyone out of atmosphere, so we have to be careful. Liar! We reach the surface, and he sends R5 to 
and I quote, I need you to scout ahead and analyze the atmosphere. Um, Mando, do you know, I mean, you do know, right? You know what an atmosphere is. The, the droid doesn't actually have to scout ahead for, for this bit. He can, he can just do it from the ship because the atmosphere is kind of, you know, everywhere. You, semi-sentient creature viewing this video, might point out, well, the atmosphere in the mines might be different than the one on the surface, and you would be right to point this out, but the show hasn't bothered differentiating these things. And in any case, we're about to discover that it's not necessary to differentiate them because this entire subplot is, is yeah, it's pointless. R5 goes off to the mine entrance to take a sample, but disappears behind a rock and goes off scope. So, and yeah, this is the second time I yelled at the TV, so Mando decides to go out and have a look for him. He tells Grogu that he'll pressurize his helmet, so the whole atmosphere thing was fucking redundant to begin with. He'll pressure his helmet and go outside. He further tells Grogu to seal himself in his pod, which doesn't exist anymore because they took it out to install R5. He then goes for a wander, and the camera goes back to Grogu, who has not sealed himself in his non-existent pod, and is just looking out from the recently opened cockpit. Meaning, of course, that if the air was toxic, he would now be dead. Meaning, too, that if Mando, his surrogate father, had looked back even once to make sure he hadn't accidentally gassed his child, he'd not have needed to pressurize his helmet anyway. And by the way, if his helmet can filter out atmospheric toxins and such, can't it tell him if the atmosphere is toxic? And then he does look back, and he sees that Grogu hasn't sealed himself in the non-existent pod, and he sees, moreover, that he's very much not dead, and his response isn't, Oh my god, I'm so happy you're alive. It's not even, I thought I told you to seal yourself in your pod, or, hmm, I guess the atmosphere must be fine after all. No, it's, Don't worry, kid. I'll be right back. It is this kind of shit that is going to guarantee writers are made unemployed by chatbot AIs. How do you cram so much self-defeating, contradictory nonsense into such a small space of time? By this point in my first viewing of this episode, I was firmly of the opinion that this entire season would actually be improved if you stripped all the dialogue out of it, because the dialogue can't even be relied upon to reference the things happening on the screen anymore. And you do have to wonder whether this isn't in part a consequence of Pedro Pascal being a lazy hat and dubbing in all his lines from the comfort of his living room or wherever he does his recording these days, because surely, surely, if you had actors speaking lines from the script while on the set, surely someone would have noticed that the lines don't match the actions and events? Surely on set, someone might have said, wait, but he just said seal yourself in your pod and he, and he hasn't done that. Surely somebody would have fucking noticed that the episode appears to be working from two different drafts of the damned script. But no. Instead, we get this. Down in the mines, Mando gets accosted by some hairy creatures who might have clued him into the atmosphere not being toxic, but whatever, and he decides to give the Darksaber a run out, which is of course slow and difficult and altogether less efficient than almost any other weapon he has, but this is Mando, and he does nothing better than using the wrong weapon for the job. He beats them and rescues R5, and they go back to the ship. At this point, Mando actually stops Grogu from opening the cockpit until R5 confirms the air isn't toxic, even though he himself opened the cockpit just a couple of minutes ago without that data and heedless of the fact that it might gas the little frog kid to death. Happily, R5 confirms that yes, the atmosphere is breathable, and this leads Mando to observe that Botox Karen was right, Mandalore isn't cursed. Which means I now have to play you the clip from the first episode where she says exactly the fucking opposite, oh my god. There's nothing left. That planet has been ravaged, plundered, and poisoned. Bo-Katan was right. Mandalore is not cursed. Go away! And so, for no discernible reason, this means that rather than leaving him in the safety of the ship, Mando can take Grogu down with him into the mines he knows to be inhabited by evil hairy monster things because... because this is the Mandalorian and this is just the kind of crazy shit that Mando does. I wonder if it'll somehow become relevant again later. They go further down and further down and further down. Mando is, of course, aware of the evil monsters and alert in case they stage another ambush. And so you might think that he'd turn on his heat-seeking predator vision thing that his helmet has that lets him detect heat sources and pretty much everything else because, you know, that would be the right decision. But because it would be the right decision, he of course does not, and instead turns on his helmet torch. 
Okay then, the mines are old and leaky. He tells us that the water leaking from the pipes will flow down to the mines and the living waters within, which is what you might call a soft problem, because it at least raises the possibility either that these waters are themselves living water, or else that the living waters have been so diluted by the spillage that they'll no longer be magical. But that does constitute a bit of a nitpick compared to the glaring holes in the rest of the plot, so we'll not linger on that. Finally, near the bottom of Moria, just before the Bridge of khazad -dum, Mando gets ambushed by a curious machine creature that one presumes has just been lying in wait down here for, what, decades? Hoping that one day someone might come by that it can grab for its nefarious purposes? The subsequent segment is rather strange and horrific, because from inside the machine comes another machine creature, and for a minute, I have the terrible suspicion that they had found some way to bring back General Grievous. It bears a superficial resemblance, it makes some of the similar noises, it even uses a similar weapon to the glow sticks we remember from Revenge of the Sith, but happily, I believe that to be mere resemblance and not a revival. Quite what it does down here and why is unclear, however. One can tenably suppose it mostly feasts on the monsters, mostly, and yet it seems very well prepared for more heavily armed and armoured prey, and well equipped to deal with them. By deal with them I mean it injects Mando with some sort of sleepy serum, then trusses him up in a cage, and connects various tubes to him, and begins siphoning out his blood, but not before Grogu attempts to use the force to free him and gets detected, meaning little Grogu scurries back to his egg, and then has to escape the mines. As with everything about Grogu, certainly everything about him when he has to move, it must surely be a conscious attempt at it's so bad it's good. And to be honest, I'm not wholly against it. People kicked up such a fuss about the overuse of CGI in the prequel trilogy, and CG Yoda's comparative lack of charm next to the puppet, the complaints about puppeteered Grogu must leave the creators wondering just how the hell they're supposed to win. For myself, I quite like the janky marionetting. I think they do add some distinctive old-timey charm and cutesiness to it. And to the extent it's supposed to look a bit funny, the fact it does in fact elicit the occasional laugh constitutes the rarest of things in this show, a job well done. Albeit, it does yank the tone about something terrible when it's used in the wrong place, and this scene arguably constitutes the wrong place. We've gone from horror to comedy in the time it took Grogu to hop into his egg, and we'll very shortly be back at blood-stealing horror again, so it's not all that clear what tone the writers were striving for here. Grogu blasts his way past a couple of monsters with the Force and makes it back to the ship, where, and brace yourselves for this, there is actually a payoff to an earlier piece of information. Shocking, I know, but when Mando purchased R5, Pol Potto did mention, in a throwaway line, that it was capable of piloting the ship, and the payoff for that is here, as Grogu points at the map showing Botox Karen's castle and R5 pilots the ship away. It doesn't change the fact that R5's presence completely broke the previous episode, but you know, it is evidence that occasionally the writers do pay attention to what they're writing. Botox Karen is displeased to see Mando's ship return, and suggests to her droid and only friend that they might get rid of him once and for all. Which plan might, in her mind, have involved, I don't know, challenging him in combat to win back the Darksaber? Because I'm pretty sure that's a thing she could and should do? But which plan in the event translates as telling him to fuck off again? This damp squib is dampened to death when she realizes that Mando isn't aboard and Grogu has come alone. So from being prepared to tell Mando to bugger off, she instead becomes suddenly very concerned for his safety. R5's data tells her where to go, so she hops in an admittedly lovely looking spaceship and goes down to rescue him. Speaking of occasions where it would be better if the characters didn't speak at all, during their descent, looking out over the bombed out ruins of the city, she turns to Grogu and says, It didn't always look like this. It didn't always look like this. Which surely even little baby Grogu would consider astoundingly fucking obvious. Yes. And therefore astoundingly fucking supererogatory. Grogu agrees to guide her down further into the mines, and it's worth noting the size of the doorway through which they have exited the ship here, and how it's not quite wide enough for two people to stand abreast. Just an observation, no relevance really. It's not as though the show will later decide that three giant baby pterodactyls can fit through it or anything absurd like that. Off they go down the mines, and Botox Karen randomly and pointlessly takes off her helmet to deliver a very quick line about how her family used to rule this civilization before putting the helmet back on again as the quest proceeds. Every time her helmet comes off, the acting gets worse, so it is probably for the best that she will shortly confine herself to it. She girl bosses her way past some hairy monsters with considerably more ease than Mando demonstrated, 
Meanwhile, not General Grievous is busy siphoning Mando's blood. All those many thousands of blaster bolts he's tanked all over, and this is the first villain who's thought to bypass his armor. Progress has been made. Botox Karen grabs the discarded Darksaber and a fight ensues, in which she beats first the normal Not General Grievous, and then the armored up Not General Grievous, again with far greater ease and dexterity with the Darksaber than Mando showed. Though it once saying that this is probably one of those occasions where girl bossness is justified, given Botox Karen's long and storied history in the animated shows, where if you care to find it, you can see her learning these skills and gaining these powers and abilities. As for Mando's general incompetence, that's not especially justified, but it has been his default through the three seasons he's had so far, with rare and notable exceptions, and so we cannot here accuse the show of reducing him to elevate her. He was already pretty much on the ground. She rescues him, and they have a chat about how miserable Mandalore now looks, but he refuses to rest because he needs to go take a bath in the living waters, for reasons the show really ought to have addressed or at least considered, and so naturally did not, he picks up the Darksaber again, and that is all absolutely fine. The rule, as I recall it, is that it must be won from the owner in combat, and so technically it couldn't pass to Botox Karen, even though she rails against precisely that kind of superstition in this very scene. But it's also the thing she's been hankering after for as long as we've known her, the thing on which all her dreams and aspirations are hinged, the thing she lost, and with it seemingly those dreams and aspirations as well, the thing she finally got her hands on in the last scene and wielded in battle, you would think she would have some reaction, any reaction at all would do, to seeing it taken by Mando again. Something small would have sufficed, a lingering look, a frown, a sigh, just something to remind us how important this thing is to her. But either it's the Botox preventing that kind of facial dexterity, or it just didn't occur to the writers. In any event, Mando picks up the Darksaber, and we proceed as though it's of no significance at all, it's just another tool on his belt. We get more ruminations on the downfall of Mandalore and the Mandalorians as we descend. More of her cynicism about superstitions and such, then the loss of her father, and almost something good here, since the show seems oh so vaguely aware that all this stuff should move Mando quite profoundly. The show is faintly aware of the irony of their respective positions. She who lived here saw its splendor, she whose father died for the planet and the faith and the people that Mando never knew but somehow values more. You've got the potential for a complex interplay of character, motive, and ideal here. Survivor's guilt coupled with religion, mystified by distance, story so fantastic to him but mundane to her, she so flippant about the thing that animates his entire reason for being, her father dying in fulfilling the code he lives by but she does not. There's a huge amount you can do with all of this stuff, an amount so vast even the writers of this show can't ignore it completely. But if there is to be a payoff for any of it, it's not coming yet. It's not coming through any of the four episodes we've seen so far. Instead, and in this scene, Mando simply pauses and looks at her a while and says, this is the way. And you find yourself hoping, hoping that that line is as significant as it should be. Then again, Mando's always been a blank protagonist. It's that that makes him popular. Because you can read into him all manner of thoughts, beliefs, values, and opinions. You can even apply all your knowledge of the law to him and he becomes much more fleshed out in your mind than he's ever been or likely ever will be on the screen. I don't say that just to be cynical, there is a real value to that kind of characterization or lack thereof, but its ultimate worth must rest with the intent behind it. Do the writers know this is what they're creating, or have they accidentally hit upon it because they're too lazy or incompetent to apply ideas of their own? Sadly, the plot then moves forward again. They find the living waters, Botox Karen narrates a bit more of the lore, most notably the blandly named Mythosaur, which we'll probably come to learn a lot more about as she gradually morphs into Daenerys Targaryen. Mythosaurs are giant creatures believed to be extinct, which the Mandalorians of old were said to have ridden, of which there is a legend saying Mandalore will rise again when the Mythosaur return, presumably ridden by Botox Karen. So it goes. Mando goes into the living waters and promptly sinks like a stone, and on first watch, I honestly thought he'd been grabbed by some monster, though on second watch I'll say it's just not especially clear. What is clear though is that although he's been underwater for about two seconds, by the time Botox Karen leaps in, he's contrived to sink tens if not dozens if not hundreds of feet and has conveniently and instantly lost consciousness. She even has to use her jetpack under the water to get down to the bottom to retrieve him. I'm not sure what the show wanted us to believe happened here, but there's absolutely no way he could sink faster than her jetpack propelled her, or as far as he did, or as quickly as he did. 
and there's no way he could have been dragged down there by a creature, leaving it enough time to disappear entirely by the time she entered the water. It really just plays out like a convenient way to get both characters into the murky depths where Botox can indeed get a glimpse of a probable Mythosaurus lurking down there, which of course Bando didn't see because going underwater causes him immediately to pass out. She rescues him, they jetpack all the long way back up to the surface, and that's the end of the episode. Important to note for the next one, they've both now bathed in the waters and as yet, neither has removed their helmets, meaning by the questionable logic of the code they are both redeemed. This will become relevant presently. Before we move on to the next episode, I do want to stress, and I hope I've made this at least slightly apparent, that there are bits about all of this I do still like. The aesthetics, some of the world building and the backstory, and above all, the fact that everything we see on the screen is meant for the world it's depicting, and not as some coded or oblique commentary on our world. It's one of the things that makes The Mandalorian watchable and even enjoyable, despite the catastrophes frequently inflicted upon it by its writers. As I said at the top, it's a show that benefits from only having half your attention, and which does its damnedest to make sure the other half is off somewhere in the galaxy it's set in, telling or remembering or imagining other stories that could and should be told. A sentence that unfortunately has to end with the word instead. It really is a crying shame that its competence in this area is at least matched and is increasingly being overmatched by the staggering incompetence of everything else. The best of the Star Wars shows, with the exception of Andor, is actually the worst show you could possibly make with all these ingredients. And just when you think it might be staging some sort of narrative recovery, it jilts you at the altar. So with that out of the way, we progress illogically but at least chronologically to episode 3, the one that wishes it were Andor. Episode 3 begins where you'd expect it to and then goes somewhere very different for questionable reasons. We kick off in the mines of Moria, where Botox Karen has hauled Mando up from the depths but apparently not bothered checking whether he's alive or even trying to resuscitate him. She's left him lying there, potentially full of water, so she can have a stare. But although this show may eventually have her replace him, that moment is not now, so he belatedly starts coughing and comes back to life. He takes a vial of the water for safekeeping, then all but confirms that he wasn't in fact dragged all the way to the bottom of the well, he merely fell, which is physically impossible for the reasons previously stated, but oh well. He also confirms that he didn't see the Mythosaurus down there, and Botox Karen doesn't think it worth pressing the point, so they hop back aboard her very pretty spaceship and head back to her castle. You'll note that despite having previously taken her helmet off at random moments to deliver inconsequential lines, she has so far not removed it to deliver any of her lines since rescuing Mando from the water, and this will become relevant presently. For now, the show decides to take inspiration from the old arcade-style Star Wars games, Rogue Squadron, X-Wing and such, and a host of TIE Interceptors suddenly appears to attack them. This all looks lovely, but once again, it would have been better had all the dialogue been stripped from it. In the first place, we're not alone in wondering where the TIEs came from. Mando asks this question as well, and Botox Karen mentions something about pissing off Imperial Warlords, which not only doesn't answer the question, but actually poses more that the show doesn't bother to account for. TIE Fighters, TIE Interceptors, as we know, are short-range fighters. They have no hyperdrives. A fighter that size couldn't get this deep into space on its own. Meaning they must have come from a nearby planet or from a capital ship. Not that the show even attempts to reach this conclusion. We, having reached that conclusion, must then ask, if they came from a nearby planet, then there's been an Imperial Warlord in the same star system as Botox Karen's palace for, what, two years? So why is it taking them this long to attack, given by her own admission she's royally pissed them off? That's some minor world-building stuff. The stakes in the chase come from her informing us that her ship's shields will not hold for long, so Mando has to man a turret to fend them off, even though it's not at all apparent that this alters their condition at all. There are still the same number of ties shooting the same number of times from roughly the same distance away, Mando being a pretty naff shot himself. That's not especially concerning, providing that we don't get a piece of dialogue later in the sequence that downplays what we were just told were the stakes. Our shields aren't gonna hold. You take any damage? Just shields. Good job. Oh, and we also get a completely needless throwaway line from Mando to inform us that interceptors are a lot tougher than TIE fighters, which is one of those things that really could and should have been shown rather than told. It all looks great, of course. The chase culminates in Mando dropping from the ship on the move to land, appropriately on the landing pad, getting to his N1 just in time to escape a conveniently summoned straggling interceptor that, 
for reasons having to do with but it would be cool, wasn't with the main group and was just casually hanging back, waiting for his cue to enter the scene. I've praised the soundtrack already in this review, though I think it wants saying that season 3 hasn't been quite so innovative or even so appropriate as the previous two seasons. This doubtless has something to do with the original composer, Ludwig Göransson, having been replaced for this season by Joseph Don't Call Me Shirley. He's still using some of Göransson's themes and signatures, and in this scene definitely overuses them, since Mando's telltale discordant whistly flute thing <laughs> plays whenever he does anything, and he does quite a lot, like so. I will praise the visuals a little more though before we move on. To my eye, the ship battle looks better than much of what we got even in the sequel trilogy, and especially in The Force Awakens. If you recall Finn's X-Wing squadron rescuing our pathetic excuses for heroes from Masconata's castle, you might, like me, have been a bit disappointed with the way the ship's movement strayed into the uncanny valley, maneuvering too tightly and cleanly for objects of their weight going at their speed. It's a gripe more than a major criticism, but I think it does want saying that special attention has to be paid to movements like this when you're creating your ships entirely via CGI, because you don't have that innate sense of physics that comes from maneuvering physical objects around to create your scenes. Models have weight, and when the models are static, your moving camera likewise has weight, and seeing these objects arranged in front of you gives you a more intuitive sense of what they're capable of than when they're arranged digitally. That's not to say you can't recreate it digitally, and you can recreate it quite easily, but it is to say that you have to make more of an effort to account for the physics of the thing that you're making. This scene in Mando manages that in a way that The Force Awakens quite often did not. That being said, Mando continues his habit of using the least likely weapons for the moment, at one stage hitting an oncoming interceptor at point-blank range with a torpedo, despite having a perfectly good laser cannons on the front of his ship that, presumably, cost much less to replenish. Botox Karen manages to hold the interceptors off long enough, through a combination of her skill and their incompetence because they're Imperials and that's just how they work, for Mando to come up behind and take out a few more of them, and finally, through an insane but cool-looking maneuver, Botox Karen takes out the final one. R5 falls over, this is funny. Mando asks her if she took any damage, and she says, just shields. Which, yeah, does kind of detract from the peril invoked by the last mention of shields, but oh well. We're still doing a flight simulator though, and anyone who's ever played the old Rogue Squadron or X-Wing games will be familiar with the way new missions and objectives are introduced through a combination of dialogue and flashing icons on the scope, which is exactly what happens here. Hang on, I'm seeing something on the scope. It turns out, the Interceptors weren't the only Imperial ships to have spawned seemingly from nowhere. A squadron of Thai bombers was also deployed from the ether, and they're now bombing the shit out of Botox Karen's castle, again prompting us to ask just why the hell it took them this long to get around to doing that. Like any good Rogue Squadron game, the mission then becomes chase the Thai bombers and shoot them from behind. But then a dozen or so more interceptors show up, and so they have to break off the pursuit. So they do indeed break off the pursuit and run away. R5 falls over. Again. This is funny. And also completely out of place, since the scene is supposed to convey that these bastard Imperials have bombed Botox Karen's home again, which you'd think would be immediately sad and also sad on a meta level, bringing back nasty memories of the Purge. Though the show doesn't ever really make that connection in the minds of its characters, so we just kind of move on. Botox Karen observes that this is quite a lot of ships for an Imperial warlord, and we'll just have to take her at her word on that, because really, who's to say what the normal amount of ships for an Imperial warlord is? If the Warlord is rucked up on a Star Destroyer, it's actually not very many at all. If he's from a planet with an old airbase on it, it's likewise not very many ships, but never mind. My theory at this stage, by the way, is that the Warlord will turn out to be Moff Gideon, because the show has been and will continue to be deliberately and almost hilariously cagey about where he is and what happened to him. The only alternative I can think of is Grand Admiral Thrawn, and I can't believe there was once a time when I'd have been excited to see him in live action before the dark times, before Disney. They jump away back to the Mandalorian covert, and we jump away then to a sumptuous looking Coruscant, which is where we're going to spend practically all of the remaining episode. The opening recap to this episode reintroduced us to Dr. Pershing, who you might remember from early in season one and late-ish in season two. He's the scientist who, under orders from first the client and then Moff Gideon, 
was trying to inject Grogu's magic blood into test subjects for nefarious and nebulous cloning related reasons. He was captured in season 2, and now we're being reacquainted with him on Coruscant. He's part of some rehabilitation program for ex-imperials, and well, there is quite a lot to be said about all of this, and I think the best approach is to take it as it comes. For now, I'll say that this extended 40 minute side story copped an awful lot of flack that more properly belongs to everything else in The Mandalorian. It's actually less stupid than the rest of the season so far, but it's also much longer and much more ponderous and less flashy and action packed. It feels distinctly like a pastiche of Andor in the tone it attempts to strike, and because it actually tries occasionally to tell a character led story, and because among its typical Mando style nonsense, it actually does try to convey some interesting ideas. I'm sure there is quite a large overlap between people who hate Andor and people who unironically adore The Mandalorian. Please ignore the footage on the screen, I don't know how it got there. Unfortunately for the writers of this show, it doesn't do Andor well enough to satisfy the 5 or 6 people who actually liked Andor, while it does too much of Andor for people who'd otherwise quite like The Mandalorian, meaning it effectively pleases nobody, but we're going to come to that in a moment. For now, Mr. Pershing's speech. There's rather a lot to say about his speech. I will summarize it first without comment. Dr. Pershing gives the speech about his scientific work and research to a large auditorium full of Coruscant's well-to-do high society types. He talks about the work he did for the Imperial Remnant and how his intentions were pure but twisted by evil people who wished to use cloning for their own evil ends. He thanks the Amnesty Program for saving his life and pledges himself to use his research to aid the New Republic. He gives us and his audience his backstory. He lost his mother when he was young to a rare heart condition that couldn't be cured because, and I quote, simple organ cloning was not available on his home world. This is what inspired his research, perfecting cloning technology, building on the work done by the Kaminoans. His goal was to effectuate a cloning technology that could combine the best attributes of multiple clone donors, rather than simply recreating a single person from a single donor. And that's pretty much it. Where the fuck do, where the fuck do we begin with this? Uh, the problem, the problem, let's start with the problem, which is the problem we'll encounter throughout the episode anyway. The problem is that there is some good in all of this, but like Pershing's research, it has been corrupted by shitty people to produce something faintly horrific. From the top then, the stuff about the Amnesty Program, the New Republic attempting to reintegrate former Imperials and using their works and designs and researches for good instead of evil is a good premise. You can do a lot with that. It has a solid grounding in the real world. Dr. Pershing is essentially the idealistic Von Braun type Nazi scientist who is useful enough that the Allies employ him rather than sending him to prison. There are implied depths to the New Republic and the wider functioning of this world we glean through this little passage, a wealth of stories of history, politics and whatever else. We have to glean this because the show, alas, doesn't really do much with any of the ideas it's introducing here. In fact, it's shortly going to destroy much of the good work by revealing that this genius scientist, who's been invited to give the Coruscant equivalent of TED Talks on his cloning research, has actually been stuffed in some random warehouse the rest of the time, and his day job is simply filing paperwork. But we will come to that in a moment. Sticking with the speech, his stated motive and his stated aim don't really align. The former invites as many historical problems as the previous sentence invited historical possibilities. He bemoans the lack of simple organ cloning before going on to invoke the work of the Kaminoans, two things that don't easily marry. It reminds us that cloning was very well established in the Star Wars galaxy before all of this, while telling a story that relies on the absence of cloning as a well established technology. Now, I believe there are reasons given in the old expanded universe that attempted to explain why cloning, which was quite recently used to create a whole massive army and the original backbone of Imperial forces, had all but disappeared by the time of the original trilogy. I am not aware that anything within Disney's version of the EU has attempted an equivalent explanation. The episode actually tries to dismiss the question entirely with a throwaway line about the New Republic having made cloning illegal, which doesn't explain a why, b what happened before the New Republic, c why there should have been a blanket ban including say cloning organs for medical purposes, or d how any such ban could possibly have been enforced with 100% efficiency. George Lucas created the difficulty by making cloning such a pivotal part of the prequels, but it was never an insoluble problem. The problem stems from poor attempts to solve the problem. Disney's canon has it that cloning was a thing, then it seemingly disappeared, except that then the Imperials were still doing it until they weren't, and despite Dr. Pershing here giving a TED talk about it, 
Within a relatively short time that elapses between this TED Talk and the rise of Skywalker, cloning has faded in the minds of the New Republic who commissioned the TED Talk to Secrets Only the Sith Knew. Pershing begins by explaining that his motive was the death of his mother from a heart condition, because simple organ cloning wasn't well established. But again, the existence of the clone army shows that it was and must have been, given, you know, clones have organs. Hell, we in the 21st century can manipulate stem cells to create specific organs. It's very hard to see how and why the medical implications of the Kamino One's work haven't been widely and cheaply adopted as standard across the galaxy. Pershing then elides a gap where reasoning is supposed to be, to explain that his ultimate goal was to create a cloning technology that allows for the combination of traits from separate donors, which wouldn't have saved his mother, which was the reason he embarked upon this quest to begin with, but which is also implausible, given the Kaminoans were able to meddle with the genes of the clones they were making. Accelerated aging and enhanced obedience were part of the sales pitch for their clone army, after all. And hell, the writers should be well aware of all this, since they quite recently produced the book of Boba Fett. And do you remember Boba's origin? Fett demanded only one thing, an unaltered clone for himself. Pure genetic replication, no tampering with the structure to make it more docile, and no growth acceleration. It's unclear exactly what combining the genetic traits of two donors could achieve that meddling with genes generally could not, with the apparent exception of recreating force abilities, though even that is a pretty dicey proposition. One of the problems George Lucas created that might in fact be insoluble is the reduction of the force to a biological mechanism in midichlorians. Could the Kaminoans not simply have identified the genes required to create or attract midichlorians? Yet that is the only exception that springs to mind. The purpose of cloning for a general population for medical purposes is not to make them force sensitive, it's to cure heart and other organ problems. The purpose of genetic engineering, a distinction this speech pretty much elides, is to preclude those problems in the first place. Pershing's groundbreaking research was in a field already established, and its purpose was to solve problems that should logically already have been solved via means that wouldn't actually have solved the problem. Credit is due, I guess, for the show even broaching something like character motive and world building, but much more credit is lost for the incompetent way they've gone about it. And that is not the last time in this episode that we'll have the cause to say that, believe me. Pershing's speech has been watched by another even less memorable character from earlier seasons, who is conveniently also part of the rehab program. She was so irrelevant that for the scene in the opening recap, she was only credited as comms officer. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's this woman. Comms officer woman, you remember her, right? More recently spotted being a generic girl boss in Ant-Man 3, Quantum of Solace, or whatever that film was called. She's going to become relevant again in a minute. After a terrifying encounter with some rich people, Pershing takes a car back to the rehab accommodation, which is one of the rare occasions in which to fault the visuals in this show. They're in an open-topped car, flying at speed high up in Coruscant, and yet wind, well, wind just doesn't exist on this planet apparently, creating quite an uncanny effect. We see the backdrop flying past, but that's quite clearly what it is, a backdrop. Absence of little details like wind ruffling clothes and hair is the difference between a believable and unbelievable scene. It is such a simple problem to fix, either stick a big old fan in front of him on the soundstage, or even more simply, put a roof on the car. A little glass bubble is all it would have taken, and you'd have had a far less jarring contrast between foreground and background. Dr. Pershing is invited for a drink with a bunch of other Amnesty Program enrollees who, for reasons unfathomable, have been given number designations rather than names. I say for reasons unfathomable, that's not quite fair. The whole shtick of this elongated portion of the episode is dehumanization. None of these people are individuals, their individuality is quite deliberately stripped from them. Numbers instead of names, dead-end menial labor, routine clinical examinations from faceless robots, it's all very… well… it's very Andor. And it's actually done… reasonably well. The episode shows the tensions between conformity and self-fulfillment, and deploys a few accurate and effective means by which the latter can be crushed to produce the former. The question though, which doesn't occur in Andor because of the difference in setting, is… Why? Why should the New Republic be deploying what in Andor was shown to be experimental and punitive measures enacted by a dictatorial empire? This is not necessarily a flaw, but everything depends on the depiction of the New Republic going forward. The point of all this is to suggest, and later to show, that the New Republic is replicating the worst features of the Ancien Regime, and if that is the point then it's a big thing, with significant moral implications. There's nothing wrong with asking what was it all for, 
of the rebels' victory over the Empire and all the rest. You can do fascinating things with that question. You should do fascinating things with it. And the old expanded universe did some very interesting things with the evolving character of the New Republic. But it has to be a question that's consciously asked, with a mind to its consequences. And the problem here is twofold. In the first place, the only Star Wars writing team that's demonstrated itself capable of handling this type of question is not working on this show. And this show has demonstrated the opposite of the skills required to interrogate what it's setting up here. In the second place, this isn't really an open-ended question. We all know what this is building toward, and the depiction of the New Republic in the sequel trilogy does not support the idea that it lapsed into the character of the Empire it replaced. I need you to go see the Senate right away. Tell them I insist the Republic take action against the First Order. No respect. Will the Republic listen? Not all the Senators that go and say on the contrary, it's portrayed, to the extent it's portrayed at all in the very few mentions it gets before it's blown up by Starkiller Base, as complacent, not tyrannical or cruel. Leia still serves it at the time of The Force Awakens. Her frustration is with the ignorance and carelessness of its leaders, not with its fundamental moral nature. All this leaves you with the sense that this isn't really being done with a key eye to world building, but rather that the writers for this show observed what was happening with Andor and simply tried to transplant the effect without understanding what made it work. And by work, I mean logically and philosophically, arguments about pacing and characterization and the other common gripes with that show are handled in a video on my second channel. It's a shame, because in isolation, what The Mandalorian is doing here is, or could be, quite interesting, but it doesn't have the luxury of isolation. It has to build off and towards something, and alas, that isn't what it's doing. But anyway, treating it with as much isolation as we can possibly afford it. What makes these scenes interesting is their ideas, while their deployment and pacing kind of lets those ideas down. Having kicked off with a high-octane starfighter battle, we're then slammed into ultra-slow motion, which does afford time for some genuine character work, but which doesn't even try to smooth the gaps between these two very different approaches. There's some quaint and not terrible banter between the rehab enrollees, reminiscing about their time with the Imperial Remnant on the Outer Rim, and an anecdote about biscuits that will, somehow, become relevant later. Then, illustrating one of the subtler differences in quality between actual Andor and Andor Light, we see Pershing in his bedroom reading up on... Coruscant. That's, um, that's Coruscant, the center of Imperial rule, center of the whole galaxy, seat of the Emperor, center of galactic politics for hundreds if not thousands of years, so... So yeah, totally irrelevant little planet that an until recently Imperial scientist couldn't possibly have ever heard of or been familiar with until this point. Yes, he absolutely needed to read up on this. Honestly, the way these Star Wars shows forget their own timeline is just staggering. Like the references to cloning as secrets only the Sith knew in The Rise of Skywalker, or indeed references to the Jedi as some ancient religion earlier in this very show, it's like the writers have collectively thought it would be very convenient if years were decades and decades were centuries, and because that's convenient, they've made it so. Via a biscuit transition that lets us know comms officer what's it A. likes Pershing and B. has access to mysterious stashes of Imperial gear, we find ourselves in the morning after with Pershing, fresh out of his high society TED talk, working his dehumanizing record filing job in a basement. And once again, it's worth highlighting the difference between what Andor does and the way this show tries to ape it without understanding it. Take the prison sequence in Andor, a genuinely brilliant application of Jeremy Bentham's concept of the Panopticon. It's an example of architecture married to social and penal philosophy. Everything about it is consistent. Every use within it contributes to the use of the whole. The design of the Panopticon sees a central tower, with prison cells arranged around it in a circle, such that every cell is visible to the tower, but the tower's occupants are not visible to the cells. The idea, which Orwell goes on to borrow from in 1984, is that the threat of surveillance, allied to collective punishment, makes actual surveillance not unnecessary, but far less necessary. You know you might be being watched, everyone else knows you might be being watched, and that they'll be punished for any transgression that you make. Resultingly, it's in their interest to ensure that you never transgress and vice versa, in case you or they are being watched. You've internalized authority, which produces mutually reinforcing social control, which paradoxically reduces the need for punishment. And Andor depicts all of this, in most of its subtleties, in the architecture of its prison and the roles of the inmates. It is an incredibly astute show. By contrast, The Mandalorian grasps the basic feel of the thing, but not that philosophical and mechanical totality. The thrust of this episode is, as mentioned, dehumanizing the subject in the name of rehabilitation, 
and almost all of it is geared toward proving this effect. Pershing's dalliances with the comms officer are, perhaps even consciously, designed to evoke Winston Smith's dalliances with Julia in 1984, the brief snatched glimpse of humanity, love and hope, giving the contrast that only emphasizes the triumph of the regime and exposing him to a vulnerability the regime will later exploit. And yet, because The Mandalorian decided it had to try and cram in some retroactive world building, it breaks its mechanical and mental continuity by beginning with a TED talk designed to play up the individuality of its victim. These two devices are simply not part of the same system. The first detracts from the system, the rest of the episode is supposed to be imposing. All that being said, it actually does the Winston-Julia relationship reasonably well, notwithstanding the thousands of problems already identified. I'm not describing every particular here as reminiscent of the show's pacing issues, it would take far too long, but Pershing and comms officer What's It go to a fairground type thing and they are shown becoming friends. The idea that she is a ray of humanity in his sea of drudgery, the one bright star he can see in a black sky, guaranteeing that she gains his trust. She's the only human he interacts with, so the only human he can trust. It's also the only example I can think of where foreshadowing is accomplished by ice lollies. She tries to convince him that he should continue with his research, despite the New Republic's ban on it, because following orders is what got us in trouble in the first place. And again, in terms of character work, this isn't shit. It's reasonably competent at playing off established characterization, and it does pay forward to a later revelation. None of this is exceptional stuff, except by the standards set by the rest of this show, but it is unusually competent, likewise the contrast in the next scene with Pershing's routine psychological checkup. I'm morally certain the episode has taken heavy inspiration from Blade Runner 2049. Pershing's routine interrogation by this bland, empty droid representative is redolent of Kay in 2049, who is asked rapid-fire, disconnected questions in order to gauge his emotional state through response times, expressions, tics, intonation, all manner of microscopic indicators. This episode competently repurposes the basic mechanic and uses it to further the dehumanizing premise, repeated meetings, the same bland, asinine, corporatized questions, with Pershing's character progression given to us by his shifting emotions in response to those questions. Once again, pretty good stuff. In isolation, though it lacks the subtlety of either its principal inspirations. Comms Officer Watts it finally goads Pershing into continuing his research, but he struggles. He lacks the supplies and the knowledge required to obtain them. Knowledge that she possesses, as hinted at by the Biscuits. Yes, from earlier. And having done foreshadowing by ice lollies, we also get some fairly neat foreshadowing in soundtrack. You can make out the weird quasi throat singing score from Anakin and Creamy Sheaves' operatic liaison in Revenge of the Sith as Pershing approaches comms officer What's It to take her up on her offer. This episode gets a lot of the little details right, which is why it is so astonishing that it and Mando as a whole get so many of the bigger details wrong. If you discount the problems with motive and world building and pacing, this is where the episode begins to fuck up even in isolation, because Mando's writers hawk their wares on the strength of their action sequences and their action sequences are somehow still quite shit if you pay any kind of attention to them. Pershing and comms officer What's It have to take a sky train over to a salvage yard where they'll find the mobile lab station that he needs. We'll get to the problems with Coruscant's decommissioning and salvage yard in a moment, but on the train, there are ticket inspector robots. There are only two of them. Both ticket inspector robots begin inspecting tickets from the same direction, the same side of the train, meaning of course that anyone who wants to avoid them can just, you know, walk the other way. Now I've done my fair share of ticket dodging, and I'm pretty good at it, but Pershing and comms officer What's It don't even have to use the simplest devices. They don't hide in a toilet or anything like that. Instead, they just walk away from the ticket inspectors. This involves hopping between carriages, which is believable on an earth-based train with a corridor linking them, but here we're talking jumping across open space thousands of feet in the air, which seems like a bit of a health and safety hazard to me. Nevertheless, it's what they do, all the way to the other end of the train. Know how we know we've reached the end of the train? Well, the fact that there are no other carriages might be a clue. The fact that all they can see is open space in front of them, yeah, that might also be a clue. But because this is the Mandalorian, and the people who love this show aren't big on detail, the writers decide they won't leave any room for doubt that this is, in fact, the end of the train. So Pershing turns to comms officer what's it and says, 
Yeah, th thanks, thanks, I guess. What do you imagine they'll do? Traveling at tens, if not hundreds of miles an hour? Well, naturally, they decide they'll jump. They'll jump off the fast-moving train to land, improbably but very conveniently, on some well-placed crash mats. How very lucky that the basic rules of momentum just forgot to apply themselves in this precise moment. Do not try this at home, kids. Even C-3PO would be too tactful to tell you the odds of your survival. Anyway, they've reached the decommissioning and salvage yards, and so here we have some chunky world-building fuck-ups to contend with again. Yay! Probably the most minor of them is, why are there salvage and decommissioning yards on Coruscant? It's a hyper-densely populated capital city where space is at such a premium that their skyscrapers are built thousands of feet in the air. There are whole planets dedicated to salvage. We know this from Fallen Order. It's where we begin the game, after all. We know this from Andor. It's where we begin the show, after all. We know this from the old expanded universe, where, if my memory serves, we have planets like Ord Mantell, notable for their extensive junkyards. We know there are planets and systems like Caradia and Fondor, with huge shipyards that could make use of the materials gained from salvage, which could handle decommissioning, which could even repurpose outdated designs. There are plenty of places better suited to do this than Coruscant. It's like sticking several square kilometers of toxic waste disposal in the middle of San Francisco and, um, well, actually. But the bit that pissed me off rather more than that was, wait, why are they decommissioning top of the range Star Destroyers? That's fucking ridiculous. The OT went out of its way to reinforce that the Empire was technological leagues ahead of the Rebels. We frequently get lines like, What good are snub fighters going to be against that? And from Akbar's capital ship, At that close range, we won't last long against those Star Destroyers. The OT made sure we knew that the Rebels were punching well above their weight, that they were plucky, that their chances of success were slight, that the weakness of the Empire was its arrogance, not its military inferiority. The galaxy has undergone a revolution, resulting in a change in government. It has not been defeated and subjugated by a militarily and technologically inferior force. The New Republic needs Star Destroyers. It would use Star Destroyers, because they'd be a huge upgrade on the ships available to the Rebel Alliance. Hell, the Imperials themselves kept older models in service, as all real militaries do, as long as they possibly could. It's why there are several classes and subclasses of Star Destroyer. Moreover, this show has told us several times that the Imperial Remnant are still out there and are still a great threat. Any Imperial Commander or Admiral with access to a Star Destroyer or an AT-80 or other ships of the line or heavy ordnance would have used those things to gain their power, to establish themselves as warlords, precisely because they are so spectacularly advanced compared to any local or regional competitor. To secure its position, the New Republic would have needed to use as much Imperial tech and resource as possible until it was sufficiently advanced that it could recommence the normal business of technological progress. Decommissioning Star Destroyers is a self-destructive move. These people deserve to die. They're demonstrably not up to the job of ruling the galaxy. I mean, fuck it, can we just have Palpatine back? The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be. Oh no, actually no, fuck that, go away now, Chief, please. Into the inexplicably decommissioned Star Destroyer they go, which is the show's occasion to make Star Destroyers the anti-TARDIS. Star Destroyers are about a mile long, to say nothing of their width and height and internal space and dimensions, yet it takes Pershing and comms officer Watsit a mere few seconds to find the science lab, meaning the only explanation is that the labs are conveniently placed right next to the front doors. Pershing starts gathering the random bits and bobs he needs to restart his advanced cloning lab, and naturally they all fit into a suitcase. In possession of this, they make the leave. But shock horror, the authorities arrive. They run away, but they get captured, which occasions the shocking revelation. As befitting her evil red ice lolly, comms officer Watsit is a baddie. She set him up. And I have a few questions about this, because, well, I mean, isn't this the literal and legal definition of entrapment? Here, acting on behalf of the state, comms officer Watsit has induced criminal behavior in a subject whom all the previous tests showed was conforming to the terms and purpose of the rehabilitation program. He was, by all accounts, a normal, functioning proto-member of society. He was a proto-success. He was misled by an agent acting in concert with the authorities, without whose influence he would never have committed his crimes. I mean, what the shuddering fuck is the point of the rehab program if the people in charge of it randomly and capriciously decide to sabotage individual subjects of that program? Why has any of this happened? The answer, naturally, is that the plot needed it to. But... 
and I'm not at all sorry to keep making the Andor comparisons, it's another example of the Mandalorian doing a pastiche of Andor without much more than a basic superficial understanding of the way that show was written. This is pointless cruelty inflicted for the convenience of the writers, not pointless cruelty that the writers have made fit into the context of the world they're making. The only way out of this is if you continue to depict the New Republic as, essentially, the Empire with a human face. But I'm pretty sure that's not going to be its characterization going forward, because all this is only happening for convenience's sake. So Pershing is arrested and taken into a mind-fucking lab, where he is subjected to something called a Mind Flayer, repurposed Empire tech that was once used to destroy the minds of its victims, but which the New Republic scientists have ostensibly repurposed in a milder form to, and I quote, soothe select traumatic memories. And again, the show is seemingly aware of the Empire parallels, is seemingly aware that it's making a broader point about the essential sameness of the old and the new regimes. But again, this is the Mandalorian, and the odds of it sticking with the depiction are so small, Never tell me the odds. Likewise again, in isolation, the scene is quite effective. Bland, offensively inoffensive music, bland, offensively inoffensive scientist, who claims he's been through the process himself and demonstrates the appropriate lack of personality. It does the horror aspect pretty well. But, and again, again, this is the Mandalorian, it's not Andor, meaning it can't sustain internal consistency, never mind meta-consistency. Comms Officer Watsit is present to observe the procedure. She asks to be left alone to watch, because he's her friend. The scientists say, okay, fine, I guess, and she turns the dial up to 11, meaning this mild readjustment has turned into a grade A mind scrambler. Suitably horrific, I suppose, but horrifically problematic as well. The minor problem is, why the hell have they built this machine with the ability to reach the maximum level in the first place? The much bigger problem is, when the scientists return to discover that his mind has been fucked to such a degree that he's been reduced to the intellectual level of Hassan Piker, there is literally just one suspect in the sabotage. And that one suspect has ensured that she is the only suspect by asking to be left alone in the room. Oh well, it's the Mandalorian. I'm sure we'll all have forgotten about it by the next episode. Comms Officer Watsit is praised for her compliance with the program. One of the scientists says it's nice to know that for every failure, there's a success like her. Even though the failure was a success and was only made a failure by her in full cooperation with the authorities. So this is fundamentally flawed. The scientists leave. Pershing gets turned into Hassan Piker. Comms Officer Watsit sinisterly eats a fucking biscuit. And that is not the end of episode 3, because we're finally back with Mando and Botox Karen, who've arrived at the Mandalorian covert. There, Mando proves that he's bathed in the living waters by handing over the vial. He is thereby redeemed, even though he could have taken his helmet off at any point in the interim, and nobody would be any the wiser. Botox Karen is likewise redeemed by default, because she bathed in the waters by rescuing him and hasn't taken off her helmet in the interim either even though she's been shown to take it off frequently and with little cause, and she had no preconceived reason to change this long-established pattern of behavior. Incidentally, this covert of religious fanatics who see Mandalore as their unreachable mecca have in this moment learned that the planet is not cursed or poisoned or anything of the kind. So naturally, you'd expect them to fly off there as soon as possible to reclaim it, right? This being the Mandalorian though, naturally, that is not what they do. And that is the end of the episode. It genuinely feels a bit wrong to praise it because the kind of praise I'm handing out, you had some good ideas here, it's a good try, is what you'd give to a teenager, you know, attempting their first script. Not seasoned and established writers paid oodles of cash to hell major shows in what was once the biggest cinematic franchise in the history of mankind. The fact it's one of the better episodes across the entire run of The Mandalorian on a writing level is an even bigger indictment, but... Well, we've got a long way to go, so on we go to episode 4. This is where things really nosedive, and by nosedive, I mean your nose dives into a mound of gelatinous feces. Episode 4 begins with a training montage showing various Mandalorians training to be stormtroopers, by which I mean that the first shot shows them firing randomly into a lake. Target practice without targets. Promising stuff. Others very slowly practice melee combat with varying levels of unsuccess. A couple of them shoot flamethrowers at each other, literally fighting fire with fire. And it's not at all clear what they're hoping to accomplish with any of this. Inexplicably, a couple of them are practicing jetpack maneuvers over the same lake the rest of them are randomly firing into, which is surely just asking for trouble. 
If you want to show these people honing their skills as the expert fighters you keep telling us they are show, would it have been too much to ask that you CG in some moving targets over the lake? Show us how accurate they are? Or that you get the extras in for your fist fights who'd not lose to a white belt? This is supposed to be an establishing shot, yet what in the name of Ganesh's furry penis is it actually establishing? It's not even establishing location. We know Mando and Botox Karen are here. It's where we ended the preceding episode. Ideally, you'd establish a great many things in this single shot. Location, skill of the Mandalorians, the weather, whatever the fuck else. But no, this is an establishing shot that establishes less than nothing. Because it actually deprecates what are supposed to be amongst the most ruthless warriors in the galaxy. Well done, the Favrilorian strikes again. I note too that they still haven't left for Mandalore, even though they now know it's habitable, but oh well. Mando decides that it's time for Grogu to learn combat for some fucking reason, which sounds absurd as a premise and is only more absurd in practice. Once again, the show cannot decide how mature Grogu actually is. Incompetent baby, surprisingly intelligent midget, incompetent baby, surprisingly intelligent midget, surprisingly intelligent baby, incompetent midget, it just shifts as the scene demands, and this particular scene demands that he be surprisingly intelligent midget. The Mandalorians themselves spot the nonsense of this idea. Mando plunks the little frog guy down and says, next challenger. And he's challenging Jimmy Kimmel's nephew, the Nepolorian, who we've just seen win a competitive yet inept wrestling match, intended, I guess, to demonstrate his competitive edge. I say inept wrestling match because they had to cut the scene to secure his victory. I guess finding a kid capable of the astonishing martial prowess required to trip over another kid was just too much for the casting team to handle. Having incompetently characterized the Nepolorian as a proper hyping competitive Mandalorian proto-warrior, which does count as characterization of a kind, the show proceeds to act against its own work. The Nepolorian gets to choose the weapons for this sparring match, and if you were a very competitive kid who just bested your nearest rival in physical combat, and you wanted to score a win to prove yourself, and you were placed against a two-foot-high midget child, what weapon would you use? Wrestling again, maybe? Some sort of melee weapon, a gun perhaps, since the little alien creature only has three fingers and couldn't actually shoot one. Anything really involving physical strength or dexterity and coordination. Yes, you would choose anything except what he goes for. But because that would have been very inconvenient for the writers, hyper-competitive, physically superior, stronger, taller, generally more ruthless opponent child chooses... darts. And by darts I mean wrist-mounted paintball guns. Okay then. The Nepolorian rightly asks why Grogu doesn't wear a helmet, and is told that Grogu is too young to speak the creed, so is too young to wear a helmet. The Nepolorian rightly points out that this makes Grogu too young to fight. The correct answer is, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, actually, you're correct, but the show believes it's afforded itself an opportunity for a moral lesson. So Mando says the creed says that one does not speak the creed unless one knows. The Nepolorian says, well, I know. Mando says, Perhaps this lesson is for you then. Now I think I know what the writers think they're doing here, but... But no, actually, I mean, sense, sense this makes not. And it continues to sense this make not by flagrantly violating the rules of engagement to let Grogu win, even though the Nepolorian would have won had the same rules been applied to him. Follow along if you can. They're each given a set of wrist-mounted training darts, and they're told they may fire them in any order, even though the order makes precisely no scintilla of a fuck of a difference. The Nepolorian shoots one and hits, and the fight stops so Mando can give Grogu a pep talk. The fight recommences. The Nepolorian shoots another dart and hits, and the fight stops so Mando can give Grogu another pep talk. From which we might deduce that this is a three-step turn-based duel, no? Well, no indeed. Because when the fight recommences, Grogu does some deliberately bad-looking but kind of cute flips back and forward, and then hits the Nepolorian with all three darts at once, and apparently this counts as a win, and not a huge fucking cheat. The Nepolorian's dad, who is the large one, played by, it turns out, Favreau himself, whom we shall henceforth be calling the Chunky Lorian, because he's relevant in this episode for the first time ever, repeats, one does not speak unless one knows. And by knows, I assume he means knows that the rules will be bent out of shape when the plot requires a main character to win because frankly that's the only rule in this show the nominal rules of engagement have been dispensed with entirely. The Nepolorian walks to the edge of the lake where, in episode 1, we had suddenly Crocodilosaurus. And this is the moment where I entertain myself by asking you, imaginary audience member who has never seen the show, what you might imagine happens next. 
And this is entertaining. Because suddenly a pterodactyl is the kind of answer you could only come up with if you had seen the show and so understood that suddenly a monster is its favorite plot device. So suddenly pterodactyl appears and kidnaps the Nepolorian. The chunky Lorian stops Mando from shooting at it in case it kills the Nepolorian. Instead, a bunch of them activate their jetpacks and take off after it, only to run out of fuel and lose it. Damn, you might be thinking. That's unfortunate. No one could ever have seen that coming. Except that yes, actually, they could have seen that coming. Because it turns out this is not the first time that this has happened. Even though the chunky Lorian says on takeoff that they should follow it to its lair, once they've all run out of fuel, he says, it always gets away. So, um, so, so hold on a minute. I could, I could believe just about that the Crocodilosaurus from episode one was a surprise. But here, the suddenly pterodactyl kidnaps a child and this isn't news to anyone? I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Are you telling me, show, that they know of its existence? Are you telling me that it's kidnapped multiple children? That it's lifted Jimmy Fallon's niece and Stephen Colbert's cousin and James Corden's brother? Actually, fuck that, there's no way it's big enough to lift a relative of James Corden, but the point stands. The suddenly pterodactyl has lifted many of your children and it always gets away. And yet, not only did you think it worth jetpacking after it, you haven't moved out of your cave? Or, you know, fuck it, gone and hunted and killed it after the first time? Why not? You're Mandalorians, for fuck's sake. You are not cattle. You don't just let the fauna steal your children and then shrug and say, eh, what are you gonna do? Happily, Botox Karen takes after the suddenly pterodactyl in her spaceship. Unhappily, this also manufactures a monumental fuck-up on multiple levels. A. Why haven't the Mandalorians done this themselves before now? They must have spaceships, otherwise how the hell did they reach this planet? B. Botox Karen goes after it, then comes back to tell them that she will go alone later to climb the cliff up to its nest. Meaning, well, why didn't she do it when she left the first time? And then C, when she does return, and when they do plan their ascent to Mount Shitshow, they say they can't take ships or use jetpacks because if they do, the noise will scare the suddenly pterodactyl away. Even though, even though, Botox Karen just did that right here in this fucking scene for fuck's sake show. So we get opening credits. And we return to Botox Karen saying that she kept a high altitude and followed the creature to its lair. Meaning, of course, that D. Why couldn't they all fly over it in her ship and airdrop onto it like we saw in the previous episode? Botox Karen, as mentioned, sets out her plan to return alone to the lair and climb the cliffs, which she can do because she did it all in basic training, again leaving us to ask, why did you come all the way back to tell us that this is what you could do when you could have just done it? The answer, as ever with this show, is because the plot wouldn't work if she did that, so she comes back. Which gives Mando and the Chunky Lorian the chance to volunteer to join the expedition, and the Blacksmith the chance to volunteer the rest of the training corps, though given how incompetent we've just seen them to be, this fills us with no confidence at all that they will succeed. The Chunky Lorian explains that they can't use jetpacks in case the beast hears them, and the Armorer says that if it hears them, it will kill the child. As opposed to what, show? What are you expecting it to be doing to the child already? Nursing it? Bathing it? Feeding it? Fucking it? It is a Disney production after all. But seriously, this is the second time we've been told they have to let the beast get away in case it kills the child. What do they think it's planning to do to the child? There are two plausible outcomes. Eat it or feed it to its own children. And yes, we'll get to that in a moment. For now, the volunteers are assembled and off they go to the foot of the mountain. Meanwhile, because we need the Mandalorians to actually do something with manageable stakes, they once again leave Grogu behind. But rather than locking him in a cupboard this time, they take the opportunity to fill in bits of his backstory, specifically his escape during Order 66. Remember how Mando got flashbacks to his childhood while the armorer forged bits of his armor? Well, the same mechanic works for Grogu. Yeah, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. Except that while Season 1 took care to ensure that Mando first gave the armorer something to forge, since then, she's just been permanently forging this incredibly scarce material, and so just happens to have some Beskar lying around that she can work on in order to trigger Grogu's PTSD. Which occasions our long flashback to Coruscant and the Jedi Temple during Order 66. This all superficially looks great, as you would expect, but falls apart when you pay attention. Again, as you'd expect. 
Some Jedi are guarding Grogu, the clones burst in, they shoot most of the Jedi, but some of them survive the initial onslaught. So they walk around a corner, and then just seem to forget that there are a bunch of clones right behind them, which should by rights have got them shot in the back, but no. The director here has taken the distinctly childish approach of, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist, meaning that simply walking around a corner taking the clones out of shot makes those clones disappear. The surviving Jedi get accosted from the front again, but they manage to shove Grogu and his egg into a lift before they all die. The clones reach the door and fire a good few rounds into it before the doors close, but somehow fail to hit their target, meaning that Grogu descends and gets rescued by Jar Jar Binks. Yeah, this is Jar Jar. Specifically, this is Ahmed Best, the guy who played Jar Jar, and whom we're all now supposed to believe was ridiculed on Twitter for that crime, even though social media as we know it didn't exist at that time. I've got nothing for or against Best in that sense. He was unwise enough to take the role, but the crime really is George Lucas's for creating the character to begin with. What I do have against him in this episode is that he acts much better in a green suit and prosthetics than he does in person, and his only real contribution to this episode is a few comical this is my serious phase moments. To its credit, the scene just about manages to summon some of the terror a youngling must have faced in this epochal moment. But given the weight of all this, just about is really a staggering waste of potential. Disney Star Wars has recognized the pivotal nature of Order 66, but almost always fails to exploit it to anything like its true dramatic potential. Just imagine that you were a youngling trying to escape the temple, the only home you've ever known, as it collapses around you. Escaping the troopers you grew up thinking were your friends, seeing your mentors and teachers and everyone you've ever looked up to gunned down by the very authority you were taught to serve. It's such a brilliant, terrifying tragedy that even these writers see the utility in returning to it time and time again. But then ask yourself, of all these callbacks, have any actually done the moment justice? Even Fallen Order, which I'll usually credit as being better than any of the Disney shows, for all its imperfections, kind of rushes through the moment. The best defense of the prequels was always that, for all their flaws in dialogue and humor and aesthetic, what they captured brilliantly was this epic, Greek-style tragedy, the grandness of the story they were telling. The Disney shows combined have probably spent as much if not more time reliving that moment, but even combined, have they even captured an ounce of the emotion? Revenge of the Sith gave us the epic vision of the epic scale, an epic perspective. These shows and these games have given us multiple chances to particularize the epic, to experience the tragedy on a personal scale, and yet, well, what? Collectively, they've banalized it. They've reduced it to a mundanity. They've treated it as a mere premise among premises, a device among devices, without ever actually commanding what it means, what it felt like, even as those premises invite us to do that. The death of the nameless kid in Revenge of the Sith, the one who almost makes it to Bail Organa's cloud car, has more raw feeling than the experiences of any of the protagonists we've now been shown to have experienced the same event. Anyway, McWindu and Grogu, born a convenient clone bark speeder that has an even more convenient sidecar that even more conveniently fits Grogu's egg just perfectly, and we're off on another chase through the Coruscant skyline which looks very pretty and makes very little sense. For example, their speeder is very quickly spotted by a couple of lat gunships, which join the pursuit. You'll recall that in Attack of the Clones, it is very clearly established that besides their impressive array of lasers, their guided missiles are among their most potent weapons. That film had to go out of its way to explain why, when Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Padme chased Count Dooku's speeder aboard one of these gunships, they were not able to fire any missiles, because the missiles would have insta-killed Dooku and ended the franchise pretty much there and then. Here, though, no excuse is even attempted. The gunships pursue and don't once even look to fire their rockets, because if they did, the show would end there and then. Further issues arise. The gunships very quickly manage to score a hit on the speeder, and McWindu informs us they hit the engines, which you might think means they're fucked. How can the speeder possibly fly, never mind escape the gunships, if its engine has exploded? Never mind though, because it turns out the speeder doesn't need a functioning engine. It can fly along just fine without one for as long as the plot needs it to. Yet another example of characters in this show speaking entirely unnecessary lines that only serve to create stupid problems. The chase winds up being quite destructive, with McWindu taking the speeder through a train tunnel and dodging the oncoming train just in time, with the pursuing gunship crashing headlong into it. Now it's far from impossible for the new Empire to fight this PR battle after the fact. The Jedi were traitors, some tried to escape. In stopping that escape, the Empire incurred some collateral damage. A few hundred people on a train killed here, a few civilians shot there. 
but it does teeter on the edge of unraveling Order 66, both by making the events much more public than they were shown to be at the time, and also for showing us that so many Jedi were able to escape with relative ease in the first place. If all it takes to escape is a Jedi of the caliber of Mook Windu, to reach the temple's outer limits and pinch the nearest speeder, surely dozens of Jedi would have managed a similar feat. And if Dave Filoni continues in his way, well, probably hundreds of Jedi managed it because the guy is an asshat. The train crash is a minor PR blunder, though, compared to what happens next. The engine does finally remember that it's been shut and gives out, fortunately within glide range of a landing platform. And it's not just any landing platform. It would appear to be an officially designated Royal Naboo landing platform, on which we see parked the Royal Yacht Padme fly several times throughout the prequels and the animated shows. One which even Disney's Bork's Law tells us is reserved for Royal and Diplomatic Personnel. It's guarded by Naboo security forces. This makes it, shall we say, quite a sensitive asset? For reasons that add further questions about how easy it seems to be for Jedi to escape the Persian Coruscant, it turns out these Naboo chaps are McWindu's friends and he's radioed ahead to get them to prepare the ship for launch. McWindu and Grogu crash onto the platform. Grogu's egg inexplicably stays firmly in place, even though McWindu, who was holding onto the handlebars, was thrown off by the collision. But before they can board the ship, another gunship arrives. Now, let's say you are the gunship pilot. You are pursuing a Jedi. You absolutely cannot let that Jedi escape. You see him on a landing platform with a spaceship right next to him. Do you A. Open fire on that ship immediately to prevent his escape, or B. Land next to that ship and disembark slowly, giving the Jedi time to board the escaping ship? If you picked A, well done, you are more competent than the Empire. The only conceivable reason for them to do this is that, as I mentioned, this is a very important ship belonging to a very important sovereign planet, and they cannot brook the diplomatic fallout that would come from them firing on a diplomatic vessel. But that reason is precluded because the clone's first act upon landing and disembarking from the gunship is to massacre the Naboo security forces, which naturally gives McWindu and Grogu time to board the ship and take off, and only then do the clones send completely different ships to try and take it down, a couple of V-wings chasing it through the atmosphere, firing ineffectually, giving McWindu time to jump to hyperspace and escape. Imagine now that you're old creamy Sheev. You get back from Mustafar, you fix Darth Vader, You've returned to your office and you sit there, smugly basking in the glow of your accomplishments. All things considered, this has been a pretty good day. And then, just five minutes later, as you're settling down to a nice bottle of whatever the Star Wars equivalent of scotch is, ah. an official comes in. My lord, he says, we have a slight problem. We accidentally let a Jedi escape. We might have, we might have massacred a load of Naboo security and, and tried to blow up their royal yacht. They're very annoyed and they want to impeach you. It's treason, then. And with that, Grogu's PTSD flashback ends, and we return to the present, where the armorer has forged Grogu's first piece of armor, if you don't count the mithril vest he's wearing. It's a rondel that's almost as big as he is, to go on top of that mithril vest that I had completely forgotten he was wearing, and has been wearing since the Book of Boba Fett, leaving us with the admittedly very funny prospect that Grogu might one day get a full set of miniature Mando armor to waddle around him. No, 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 no. Well, let's see if he fits. Grogu, no. Give it no. Grogu, give it no. I can't watch anymore. Destroy the Sith. We must. Over with the merry band of chuckle fucks hunting the suddenly pterodactyl, they land the ship a short walk away from the mountain they're supposed to climb. And they decide that, it being the evening now, they'd best settle down for dinner and a nap and make the climb tomorrow. By which point you would think the kid thereafter will have been dead for more than a day. I mean, what exactly do they think suddenly Pterodactyl's been doing with it all of these many hours? Why did it kidnap the kid in the first place if it wasn't going to eat him or feed him to its babies? And why, given the kid is the chunky Lorian's son, is he so calm and happy with the idea of waiting a whole night before trying to make the climb. He'll later eschew tactics and caution entirely because it's his son, but here he's fine with delaying until the morning. Some father you are, dude. But hey, at least it gives us the chance to answer another long-running fan question. I did like this where they all kind of disappeared into their little areas away from each other to eat. I didn't like that. Mm. I liked what they were trying oh. to do with that because much like with Grogu's backstory, Two fan questions. Um, 
What? How did Grogu escape? Um, I was about to say nine eleven. How did Grogu escape? <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Uh, there, there goes the last two dollars, bro. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I give up, folks. You heard it first. I give up. Starship Cheers, fuel doesn't melt Beskar beams. Oh my God! Oh, we need we need the uh, the YouTube edits of Yoda having flashbacks to nine eleven. That was. Uh, and what was the Lord's trying to say then? <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. Is he gone? He's gone. Five hours later. Uh, what I was trying to ask was, okay, you have you have the Grogu question, which is how does Grogu survive Order sixty six, and then you have, <laughs> yeah, fuck, sorry, um, then you have. How does how does Mando eat when he always has to wear his helmet? Oh. So this scene is supposed to answer the fan question. And they answer it in a really stupid way, which is that we all have to walk off somewhere else, as opposed to just turning around and not looking at each other, which you think would have been the easier way of doing it. Morning finally dawns, and so they begin climbing. They are not especially quiet in their ascent, which again would have made an airdrop so much quicker and more efficient and more effective, but never mind. Up we go, climbing in full armor, carrying huge and heavy guns, even though they've made it very clear they're not even allowed to use those. Now our hope is that the child is still alive, so we have to make sure not to fire on the raptor. It will kill the foundling if attacked. It has happened before when it has taken others. God fuck it, yes, up we go. Once at the summit, they find the suddenly pterodactyl isn't even there, and Mando uses his heat vision he almost always forgets he has to detect a vague blob of indicating life forms. Predictably enough, it turns out the life forms are the suddenly pterodactyl's babies who squawk a bit, and then suddenly pterodactyl suddenly appears again. As for what's been happening to the Nepolorian during all this time, it turns out he's been safely ensconced in its stomach for more than a day, and the suddenly pterodactyl only now decides to regurgitate him for its kids to eat. Almost as if it was just waiting for the plot to catch up with it. The chunky Lorian flies at it with his jetpack and only contrives to get himself captured, and it takes off again with the Nepolorian in its talons and Chunky Lorian in its mouth, meaning the rest of the hunting party has to fly off after it. You'll recall this is only happening because the Chunky Lorian refused to attack it earlier in case it killed the kid. But I guess, I guess they just kind of forgot that bit of the setup because here they show no qualms about taking it out with the aid of a suddenly crocodile, of course, managing to rescue both the Chunky Lorian and the Nepolorian before they go down with it. Yay, everyone lives happily ever after. Now you'll recall earlier that I asked you to note the size of the doorway aboard Botox Karen's ship, because it was then impossible to envisage fitting anything much bigger than a human out of it. Well, it turns out no, because somehow they've managed to cram all three of the suddenly pterodactyl babies aboard for reasons, and out they come, ready to be adopted by the Mandalorians and presumably ridden into battle in future episodes, so I guess we're gonna call them Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion. As a reward for Botox Karen's exploits, the armorer uses yet more of her infinite supply of very rare Beskar to fashion a new shoulder piece, which she chooses to have emblazoned with the Mythosaurus emblem. During the crafting process, Botox Karen asks the armorer how she would respond if told she, Karen, had seen a real-life Mythosaurus. Bogotan goes, I've seen a Mythosaur, and the armorer's like, yeah, of course you have, love. Yeah. No, but I've really seen it. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. Keep taking the meds, Bo. And that brings us to the end of episode four, which I think, given how long this video is, is where we will leave the show for now. I want to stress again that I don't hate the show even. It is still very entertaining, in the way watching EFAP take apart Batwoman was very entertaining. It's almost lovable even, just not for the right reasons. But it would be remiss of me not to point out that this show has been held up and some still try to hold it up as an example of good Star Wars, something like what Star Wars is supposed to be. And I'm afraid if you are so minded, then you are out of your mind. I understand the reasons, I've tried my best to accommodate them throughout this video, but the fact remains that while entertaining, this is an appallingly written show. What it does well is superficial, and the superficial is very important, see all those who shat on Andor on the dubious grounds it didn't feel like Star Wars. Andor didn't demonstrate its adherence to the franchise through superficial things like iconography and settings, familiar scenes, places and people, it eschewed fan service for the most part, and fans have been so hard done by in recent times that fan service has become much more important for its scarcity. The Mandalorian tries, by contrast, to make you love it in the way that Andor did not, 
it is nominally at least a more familiar production, and it baits the fans in with a hefty dose of nostalgia and an innocent, carefree jaunt through the old locales. It's got plenty of action, blasters, spaceship battles, lightsabers swinging, and these are all ingredients that remind us of Star Wars in its happier days. But the fact it found it so easy to win over the hearts and minds of the audience has allowed its writers to take liberties with that audience. At least as much as its iconography, what once made Star Wars Star Wars was the stories it told. These didn't have to be especially clever, in fact they benefited often from their simplicity, but that simplicity was built on solid foundations, good character work, adherence to the logic of plot and narrative. Star Wars is, or was at any rate, more than a skin-deep production. If the audience is telling the studio, as it did when The Mandalorian first came out, that we are satisfied with a superficial resemblance to the old days, then a superficial resemblance is the very best we are going to get. And because that superficial resemblance doesn't require the writers pay any attention to what they're making, it will eventually be consumed by nonsense. Entertaining nonsense maybe, but nonsense all the same.